A very pleasant good afternoon, good evening to His Worship the Mayor, Clyde James, and councillors of the borough of Point Forte, residents of the borough of Point Forte, members of the media. I am Barry Sinanan, and with me at the head table is Dr. Terence Farrell, our moderator, Dr. Hamid Ghani. Mr. Winston Rudder, Mr. Ray Sandy, and Mr. Nizam Mohammed. We are five members of the committee appointed by the Prime Minister to look at the question of rev reviewing the Constitution. Not with us today would be Heman Arain Singh, Helen Drayton, and Jackie Sampson Miguel. We have been mandated by the Prime Minister by letter dated the 26th of January to canvass the widest possible public, that is religious bodies, trade unions, the diaspora, virtually everybody, both locally and abroad, to solicit from all of us suggestions and ideas and opinions in how best we can change the constitution that we have, the existing constitution. The existing constitution is dated 1976, so it's about 50 years old now, or approaching 50. It needs changing. And it is from your input and your suggestions, we will craft uh, terms of reference to give to the Prime Minister, which will ultimately lead in a national consultation on the Constitution, what needs to be changed. Now, when you look at it, your everyday experience, you would realize that things do need changing. There are certain topical things, which I'm sure you are all aware of. But we are here tonight to listen to you, the people, and the Constitution is all about you, the people. It's all about us, the people of, Sid of Trinidad and Tobago. So without much further ado, I will hand over to the <coughs> Dr. Farrell, who would give you a brief synopsis of the, the, our entire exercise in, 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 in probably a little more greater detail. I shouldn't say brief, in a little more greater detail, Dr. Farrell. Uh, thanks very much, Chairman. Uh, so, um, as, as the Chairman said, we were appointed in, uh, well, the letter of appointment is January. Uh, the, essentially, the committee began work ar around March because we had to get certain administrative things in place. Um, this, this is the fifth time that Trinidad and Tobago is attempting constitution reform since the 1976 constitution. Uh, the 76 Constitution, some of you, some of you may remember, uh, came about in part of, uh, as a result of the work of the Wooding Commission, which worked from 1972 to 1974. Uh, many of the recommendations of that commission did not make it into the 1976 Constitution. Uh, subsequent to that, under the NAR administration in 1988, the NAR administration formed the Hayatali Commission, uh, and they began work on a process of reforming the Constitution. This was merely just 12 years after the, the 76 Constitution. That effort was interrupted by the attempted coup in 1990. Uh, during the, 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 the Manning, first Manning administration, there was no attempted constitutional reform. Uh, during the Pandey administration between 1995 and 2001, there was no attempt at constitutional reform, but in that period, there were significant pieces of legislation that were passed which had constitutional implications. These were, for example, the Freedom of Information Act, the Judicial Review Act, and the Integrity in Public Life Act. Uh, 
Then, uh, with, the, with the Manning administration coming in in 2002 to 2010, there was an initiative by a, a, a group of businessmen, so this was not a government initiative, this was a, a, a group of businessmen called the Principles of Fairness Committee, and they attempted to draft a constitution. They attempted to reform, put forward a, a, a draft to reform the constitution. That draft was actually um, done by Taj Mahal Hussain, one of our most outstanding uh, lawyers at the time. Uh, then the Manning administration, uh, taking note of that principles of fairness draft, initiated its own process of consultation, and they came up with another draft <laughs> Uh, effort that was done by uh, Sir Ellis Clark at the time, that was around 2009. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, he had elections in 2010, so nothing came of that. And then in 2013, the UNC PP administration, there was the Ramada Committee, which again went through the process of attempting to reform the Constitution. There was a draft constitutional amendment bill done by the UNC in 2015, but then the UNC uh, left office in, 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 in September of, of 2015. So that, so that we've had many attempts at, 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 at constitutional reform. And what I think that that says is that we have recognized that every administration, the NAR, the PNM, UNC, and so on, has recognized that there is a need to change or to make changes to the 1976 Constitution. And the important thing, of course, is that as time has gone on, uh, I think many of the, 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 the need for change has become even more evident because we can see that many of the institutions which are set up within the Constitution are simply not working as they were intended to work. Uh, in addition to which, since 1976 to now, many things have happened both outside, externally. Uh, externally, for example, we have had important international conventions, for example, relating to the rights of children, we've had inter which we have signed on to. We've had international conventions on, on the status of women. We've had international conventions on economic, social, cultural rights. All of these things have happened since 1976. Our society has changed since 1976. We have seen important developments in the economy in terms of uh, the, on, on the economic side, the development of the Point Lisa's estate and economic growth and so on. But we've also seen as a society an increase in crime. We've seen increases in school violence. In, 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 so in many areas, of our national life, there has been significant change since 1976. So all of this is pointing to, the, to some kind of need for change, which, as I pointed out, every single administration has recognized that there has been a need for change. So with this effort, which we have a fairly short time to do it, but we have indicated that we, we think that it can be done in this short period of time, simply because for this committee, we are not starting with a blank sheet of paper. We are starting with the Moding Commission report, the Hayat Ali Commission report, the Principles of Fairness draft constitution, the Ellis Clark draft of 2009, and the Ramada Committee report, because they all went through that process of asking you, the people, what were your views. Our process today in 2024 is a little bit different in the sense that when the Woding Commission was doing its work, there was no internet. <laughs> There was no email, uh, there was no social media. Today we have all of that available to us to enable us to reach people wherever they are. It is easier for us to talk to people. Uh, we, are, we have, as of today, we had one of our meetings this morning, uh, reported that we have up to now received almost 200 submissions from the public via email. But we're also doing these public consultations, these town hall meetings across the country so that we can hear from you directly what your views are on constitutional reform, what proposals, what suggestions that you might have, relating those to what's happening within your local communities, because what's happening in your local communities, what's happening in the borough of Point Fortin, 
many of those issues and problems that you are experiencing, in fact, relate back to institutions within the Constitution which are perhaps not working as well as they ought to. So the town hall meetings are an important part of the process for us. And the other part of the process, which is not as visible to you or to the public, is that we are having meetings with experts. These are constitutional lawyers. These are social scientists, political scientists. We've met with <laughs> Professor Ghani as one of those people, of those experts. Professor Ghani, by the way, has worked on uh, almost all of those uh, reform efforts, except the wooding. I think he must have been too young at that point. Um, but from the higher tally, he's worked on all of these. Uh, and so we're consulting with, with, with experts on uh, issues relating to constitutional reform. So your views are extremely valuable to us. They are going to give us an indication as to what your thinking is, how you perceive the problems within your community, within the nation as a whole, and we are looking forward tremendously to your feedback. Our job as a, a committee here this evening is to listen. We, we, are, we, are, we are here to listen, to take notes, to, to get your views, which we will certainly seek to incorporate into the recommendations that we put forward. So thank you very much for that, and let me then hand over to the moderator for this evening, which is Professor Hamid Gunn. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farrell. Uh, Mr. Chairman, colleagues at the head table, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the public consultations of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. Uh, my name is Hamid Ghani, and I shall be moderating some of these public consultations being hosted by the NACCR. Uh, before we begin, I would like to offer some guidelines for how we shall proceed. Uh, individuals who are coming forward to offer their recommendations for constitutional reform uh, will have up to five minutes to present their proposals. Uh, participants are asked to be respectful of all views expressed here and all persons in attendance here. Uh, if there is available time, anyone who spoke earlier this evening may come back if they would like to express a supplemental proposal for constitutional reform. Uh, the session is being recorded to facilitate the Secretariat to compile all of the proposals advanced here tonight. Uh, I would ask that you give your name and your general area of residence so that your points of view can be properly assigned to you. Uh, I look forward to having a successful engagement this evening, and I would like to invite persons who catch my eye, and I will signal to you to come forward to the microphone or to have a microphone come to you uh, to make your proposal. Uh, before we actually get underway, um, you know, one of the things that um, we could uh, consider in our own minds just to get our thoughts going is, you know, what, as an individual, what do you really know about the Constitution? How do you view the Constitution? Uh, what are some of the things you associate with the Constitution. Um, and that, just by way of breaking the ice a little bit, is something that you might want to mull over in your own mind uh, before you uh, come forward to express any views. So I just thought I'd put that out um, to help your, your process. You may already have things that you would like to tell us, and we are anxiously looking forward to hearing you. So without any further ado, let me um, invite uh, members of the public gathered here. Uh, there's a roving microphone that will come to you. So who would like to get us started this evening? Yes, we have some microphone, please. Uh, good night to all. Name Baba Melo, D. John, Fanny Village, Point 14. 1976, I think I'll be 10 years at that point. Um, all the views in terms of the constitu constitutional reforms, I think we're missing the point that they're supposed to be the expression of the peoples and the drive of the people going forward. I think we have to shift in terms of looking at the level of our acceptance of independence. I want to say that 
almost over 50 or 60 something years, our capital is still the port of Spain. Now, if we have not looked at that even in terms of identifying up ourselves, it comes as we still lacking a level of self-identity. So the constitution that we're supposed to be governed by, it not really recognize or identify us, but they identify the political system that is need to be adjusted for certain benefits. We had a lot of constitutional amendments. Most are to satisfy in terms of loan packages or some beneficial something. None has never really been for the people to really have a better change or alignment in life. And I think one I think also should be pressed upon, even in constitutional change or any amendments in the Constitution, is where an amendment is to be made on the Constitution of the people of Trent and Tobago. Matters as this consultation should be done with the people, so whoever their representative is, no matter whatever political alignment, their representative will be going to represent the community in which they supposed to be represented in parliament when they are discussing the changes of our parliament. Because sometimes there are changes in the constitution which I don't agree with, but nobody asks me, but then after I'm to accept it. So then they question, what is my independence or what is really my status as a citizen of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago? I thank you for now. Thank you. Anyone else um, wants to express some views? Yes. Good afternoon. Members of the health table, members of the audience, good night. My impression about constitutional reform is something that I think is necessary because when you look at the changing dynamics of the world, the changing dynamics of Trinidad and Tobago, when this constitution was reformed in 1976, the world was a different world that we live in as of today. We didn't have, as you said, we didn't have the, the modern technology, we didn't, have, we didn't have internet, we didn't have social media. And we, we, how we govern, how we live, was totally different to what it is today. And we need to change with the time, right? Other things are changing around us, but we are being asked to be governed by a system that was made for us 50 years ago. And as the chairman said earlier this afternoon, there are many attempts to do reform to the constitution. And even though there were parts that were changed, the, even the parts that didn't change that did not make a significant impact on our lives. Look at a simple thing. We, have, we are going into a process of doing the reform of local government reform. And most of myself and other members of council are looking forward to the reform of, the, uh, the reform of local government because it's going to make our lives easier to govern the places that we are living. Right? Because the system that which we have to use to govern and to manage Point Fortin is totally archaic. Right? There's nothing that we can do of the spring of a finger. Everything has to go back to central government. And it takes so the process is so long and, te and tedious that it makes life difficult to get simple things done. We look forward to that. And the aspect of the constitution is the same thing. There are many aspects of this constitution that is not within our present system. And we need to look at all those aspects, find a way in which we can fine tune it for the betterment of the people of Trinidad and Tobago in totality. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any further? Yes, we have a cross here. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, good afternoon. My name is Albert Rez. I am from the Point Fortin area, actually right down the street on George Road. 
constitution reform, I think it is needed, particularly in the electoral process. So I am coming with, I'm not going with a general thing, I am coming with a particular idea that I have formulated for myself for over five, 10 years, going on 10 years. First of all, sorry, Mr. Mayor, but I would like to squash something called the municipal councils, the borough councils. I want to squash that. So therefore, we will have nothing in the, con in the country called a mayor. There is nothing called a city council. Okay? What I am saying is that we have 41 constituencies in Trinidad and Tobago. Actually, what I am doing, my suggestion is really for Trinidad. Tobago has already been sorted out. So you're not, you're touching Tobago in that there'll be nothing called Tobago West and Tobago East. For the 39 um, constituencies, when you have a general election, so I'm not calling for a local government election, I'm calling for a general election. And in doing the general election, the winner of the constituency as it is now will be the chairman of the, let's say, Point Fortin, Point Fortin Constituency Council. Local government councillors will also be selected on that day to represent their particular areas. So Mr. Mayor, how many councillors you have? How much? Six, all right. So the constituency of Point Fortin in general election terms carries you from Guapo, um, Parilan, straight down to Cedra, Sikakas. You know, and as it is now, the Point Forte general election constituency also includes the borough of Separia. Yeah, Cedras, Fullerton, Ikakas. That is, not point, that is not part of the Point Forte Borough Council. Now you are saying Point Forte from, if you want to say, Guapu, Loten, straight down the road to Ikakas. And you're picking councillors for particular areas. So the EBC will select, have the areas within the present boundaries of the Point Forte constituency. When you select the head or the MP for Point Forte, as it is now, he is also, Dr. Um, Kennedy Richards, he's also the representative for Ikakas. Yeah, he is. Because that is the general election cons cons um, boundary. So let's say we're using Kennedy as he is now. So Kennedy will be the chairman of the Point Forte Constituency Council. And your elected members before the Point Forte Borough Day, you were part of, we were part of the um, Separia something, regional corporation. You put in your boundaries, like how it was before Point Forte become a borough, you'll be elected and that will be the council. Okay? The MP, that is their job to run effectively with local government reform. Because I'm not forgetting local government reform. Local government reform to run Point Forte Constituency Council. And we're doing it throughout Trinidad. The same thing. 
So what I am saying, I am getting rid of Point Forte Borough, San Fernando City Corporation, sad to say the Royal Chartered Borough of Arima. I'm getting rid of that. Port of Spain will have no mayor. There'll be nothing called a mayor again. That's one, that's the first one, so that's 39. As for Tobago, Tobago will remain as is, but there will be no constituencies called Tobago East, Tobago West. And the ele um, all those elections will be for five-year terms. The current general election term of office is for five years. When it is done in Tobago, as it is presently in Tobago in terms of the THA, the member of parliament, we have two members of parliament for Tobago. And those two members will be the chief sec and the minority leader. Okay, that's the two that will represent. So they kind of do in East and West. They still have two from Tobago in the, in the end. So that is my first thing. So you will realize that when it now comes to parliament, you have the 39 who were elected normally. That, those MPs, that is their job. They have nothing else. There'll be no cabinet minister. They are the chairman to represent the particular constituency they are selected. One, the prime minister from the leader, as it is now, will, will be the prime minister. So what will have to happen, wherever the prime minister is, he will have to select somebody to lead within the 41. Because we'll be, back, we'll be on 41, back to 41. All right? So that's one. There will be a Senate. However, the Senate will be 20 persons. 10 ruling party, 5 independents, 5 opposition. And their role, they are senators, nothing else. And finally, the cabinet is the sole discretion of the prime minister. He cannot, he is not able to choose a senator, neither an MP, to be a cabinet minister. In there, now, the cabinet, each minister, oh, oh, one thing, we will limit the number of ministries that they will have. 20 is my, is my amount. 20 plus the prime minister. So in end to the cabinet will be 21, prime minister included. You heard that, if you realize I haven't called speaker and president of the Senate, that authority is given to the president. The deputies on both sides, that is for the prime minister to decide within MPs and senators. The cabinet ministers and the ministers will be answerable to the House of Representatives. So every week or when they were going to come and give a total discourse like how you do with the budget committees, the budget committee, and be thoroughly questioned of what is going on in their particular ministry. Okay? So in the end, I am seeing that I am putting more responsibility onto the president. As I say, the president have to, however, the other choices for the other committees, whatever is going on, remains the same. But my thinking is strictly the electoral process, and I think 
MPs are making make noise or people make noise that they don't see the MP. Why? Because the MP is busy. Their job is not 24-7. It's 30, 15 is the number of hours in the day for them. It is not nice for an MP to be sleeping one o'clock in the morning and a constituent to call and say the street light blow outside the, the window. Let the MPs be controlling their constituency. That is their job and the remuneration will go with it. So that is my contribution. As I said, it is something that I have been thinking of for years. And the bottom line in my own is that the MPs that people select, I select, you hear the complain, you don't see them. You only see them one month before a general election or one month before a local government election. Now I am giving you the opportunity to represent the people and the, and the people must be or will always be able to see you, to hear your complaints. Okay, and how a local, how the borough is run in terms of fixing road, all of that is your responsibility. The normal local government responsibilities, you're collecting your taxes, the property tax and all that, to run it and hopefully with that change, we may see something to develop Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have a... Good, good night, everyone, to the head table and to people of Point Fortin. My name is Kobe Sandy, and I'm an alderman in the Borough Council. Um, I chose to come now because um, the speaker before me made some very interesting points and I wanted to just, it also touch into what I wanted to share as well. And what um, uh, my, the speaker before me was trying to say, I believe, was looking on the topic of separation of powers. And I think that, well, of course, our country and all of those in the Commonwealth realm have adopted the, um, the Westminster form of government, which would, of course, see your executive being a part of the legislature. So, of course, a qualification to be a minister, you had to be either MP or a senator, and I think that is what he was trying to dispute. But, and I understand the, 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 the need for separating the three arms of state for much more accountability and, and, and transparency and these kind of things. But having been a student of public administration, I soon get to realize that our current system adopted by the, the, the British um, system actually is a blessing in disguise. Now why I say that is that when we look at the American style of um, politics, their executive is fully outside the, 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 the Congress. You know, the, 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 the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, it, um, you know, which comes like a minister, is outside of the Congress. But while that is a true form of separation of powers, you always often have difficulties when it comes to the execution of government policy there. Now, our society is too small, I believe, for the executive to be fully outside of the, of the, of the parliament. Now, when you look at the US, every other week, um, the, the president has to fight um, the threat of sh government shutdown because Congress may want to withhold money for the executive to do what they have to do um, to fulfill their policy and their agenda. Imagine, and take, for instance, the example of the procurement bill last year when it was proclaimed, and then it had serious effects on the public service. Ministries couldn't even buy toilet paper. <laughs> and of course, you also had the issue where the government couldn't properly, in a timely manner, um, organize their symposium at, at, 
at the time. And they had to come to Parliament quickly to get the Act um, amended um, to really and truly have a flowing public service. Now, had you had an executive that is fully outside of Parliament, you might run the risk of Parliament not agreeing to that and causing government policy to come to a halt. So, and, and when you look at the Constitution, chapters 3 and 4, no, sorry, 4 and 5, 4 which speaks on Parliament, 5 which, which speaks on the Cabinet, and the Executive is, is closely together because they understand the need. I believe the writers then understood the need of that cohabitation between the Executive and the legislature. So that is my topic on the separation of powers. I do agree that members of parliament's roles must be fully codified because oftentimes you have a mixture of persons thinking what the MP could do versus what the corporation can do or what is their role and not. I believe that rule should be codified in the constitution when it comes to amendment. Um, of course, their major role is to represent the interests of their, of, the, of their constituents in Parliament and to contribute to legislation that will affect their constituents, um, which is different from the local government stance. Um, that is on separation of powers. Secondly, with reg I think one of the main, main things that requires addressing in a serious way is how we view the operationalization of the service commissions in this country. We have various public service commissions, teaching service commission, the judiciary, um, the, the police service, the public service, etc., cetera, um, that are creatures of the constitution. And of course, if all of us in this room may disagree, one thing we can agree with is that the public service is not giving the service, the public, any good service. And it has been lost in that 1976 time or era. There has been no sort of innovation or growth within the public service because of its, it being enshrined in the Constitution. When we again adopted, and again, Professor Ghani, you of all persons, it's best to discuss this, this, this topic on the Whitehall model. I followed all of your discussions on that. Um, the Whitehall model where we would have followed from... Um, the British using their civil service um, um, arrangements back then. If we look at it now, Britain has been moving expeditiously when it comes to in implementing new public management models. And they have, of course, advanced how they would have, how they, would, how they operate the public service um, machinery. We, on the other hand, have still, still stuck in 1962 and 76 um, accordingly. I knew, for those who may not know, but NPM, known as New Public Management, is a system of governance that deals with making the public service operate much more business-like. Implementing private sector remedies or private sector practices within the public service for there to be much more efficiency and effectiveness. And you can trace it back to Margaret Thatcher, in the, uh, um, known as the Iron Lady, um, former Prime Minister of the UK, when she would have began to implement these things in the, in the various state-owned uh, enterprises. And I think going forward, we should be considering including these types of theories and innovations within the public service. There should not be persons being promoted on seniority anymore. It's on merit, meritocracy, qualifications versus seniority. You have a leadership crisis in the public service where many persons get the position of PS, deputy PS, directors, based on seniority, but they lack leadership qualifications and skills. And slow down the process of executing government policy for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is what new public management calls for, which is the introduction of meritocracy within the public service regime. And that is what I would, of course, introduce or, or, or share with, 
with the committee at this time. I'm always free to come back again to share much more information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, any other contributions we have in front here? The front here, to the left. Hello, good night. Um, my name is Anthony Williams. I'm from Captiville, but mainly from Point Fourteen. And uh, some good points, some good points. But the biggest problem we have in Trinidad and Tobago right now is corruption, right? Corruption. Corruption is the biggest problem right, right now. Where we have people putting people in place where they could generate wealth, and where the middlemen who does these middlemen contracts could generate wealth. We watch a prime minister, and I'll get to the point, shut down a whole industry, right? I work trimmer, doing contracts with my grandfather. My uncle worked there. Um, Roger worked under my uncle. I have other family who worked there. I did production, the bunker to keep production up and running. When production was 180,000 barrels a day, things was going nice. Things was happening. And then we see politicians coming in place through certain avenues and through certain investments from middleman contracts and they start tearing the whole country apart, shutting down everything. Where our prime minister could come and tell Trinidad and Tobago we have no oil and gas, where I know, working out there and doing the bunkering, right, from block station 25 to, well, 700 and, no, 676 go wide back to Southwest Salado, come back Fullerton, Chatham area, we have a lot of oil and gas, especially in the Chatham area, right? It have a history day. And I am seeing you all here, a set of old heads, no disrespect, right? With a lot of ambition that I don't see happening, right? Because we had the UNC and PNM in and out with a majority plus, and none of them ever made a move to change the constitution. Why now? Is this a show? 2025? Or are we really coming here to make something happen? Because at the end of the day, right, even in my area where we full of crime, unemployment, and I could go on 0.410 crash, right? We have nothing happening, not even in library and other constituencies. We've seen the government coming with a set of program this and program that, and we just have billboard where people get angry and tearing down. We have councillors in and out. We changed six councillors the other day because people disgruntled with them to put six new councillors who wouldn't get nothing done, right? And we, instead of we able to vote for a mayor, we se selected mayors on their, their party affiliations and their party groups and so on. And all these things not working for we at all, at all, at all. So, you know, I'm very, very angry. I'm one of those who are very disgruntled, especially with this prime minister. Very, very disgruntled, right? Because oil prices rocketing almost three years now. A finance minister telling me I will not see a profit from that because I do have a refinery. Citizens rush to support a man who don't understand one damn thing about the works and the business of this country, seeing that you want to treat it like a business, right? Where we know importing fuel, costing we more. The bitumen to fix we roads, that's why we can't get no road fixed, costing we more, and so many other things, right? And if we had something in place, everybody wanted to tear down the old English system. I don't have a problem with the system, right? The corruption is the problem. But I would like to see a new constitution. I don't want to reform. I don't want no sentences change. I don't want no lines change. A new constitution that protects the people, that protects we resources, we family, we community, and especially we safety. Because it's have a man that's tearing this country apart and we can't get rid of him because he's being protected by the prime minister, right? And referendums would have been one of the biggest things, like how they use it in the, in the UK, because the UK upgrade, and we still want to downgrade, downgrade, and tear certain things apart, and talk about make this area wider, and so on and so on. If we had referendums in Trinidad and Tobago, when you're not working properly, rather it be a community referendum or a national referendum, when the Prime Minister was making those statements about shut down Petro Train, the people would have a say, a vote on it, right? Because the government has always come and talk about we are the, um, what is called we? The, the, the persons of interest when it comes to 
things in this country, but we know it's the business community. We know it's the Syrians. We know it's the Lebanese. We know it's those with big pockets, right? And I wouldn't put Junior Sami and them in this, right? And if we had referendum, that man couldn't shut down the refinery, right? If we had a referendum, especially community referendum, we would have been able to give a, more, a mayor voted in the powers to get things done that he's not politically aligned to the PNM, where if they say to the councillors, you could only get a certain amount of road fix for the year, right? Because I just hear things on the ground, right? Where councillors can't do nothing right now because of funding, right? Nothing. We owe the Chinese them two billion TT dollars. We owe other debtors billions of dollars. We watch a government raise the debt ceiling to 75 billion. So they go and borrow more. So we come into a big budget. We have nothing coming in, nothing at all. Everything going out. But we go and borrow 75 billion dollars to do what? Right? So I would say if we had the referendums in place and all them made it law, all them made it policy, and if I could see a brand new constitution that makes sense, that protects we, and it's not a, how to say it, a basket that can't hold water, all well, will get my support. But until then, all I see in, no disrespect, is a show in front of me, a big show. Because 2025 is going to happen, it's going to play out, and God forbid this PNM government come back in power, and nothing changes. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Any other points of view? Yeah, um, Mr. Nizam Mohammed wants to may have an intervention. Before you go further, um, Tony, if I may call you Tony, um, I think Dr. Farrell, in some opening remarks, he has, he has explained to us where we are coming from in terms of trying to remedy all these set of stop gaps that we experience in the society. And a number of people who are attending tonight came in after he had spoken. I think it might be beneficial to us, Mr. Moderator, if Dr. Farrell could give us again, very short thing, um, just tell us about the attempts that have been made over the years since the Wooding Commission. As a reminder, so that um, we, uh, like my friend Tony. Before you go, like, no disrespect. No, 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 no. no. I've gone on 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. There is nothing going on in the country. I've heard this many times. But you, you, you heard, you heard what Dr. Children Farrell said. About, about um, upgrading the Constitution, about reform and reform, beating the head over and over, over and over. Local government reform, over and over, go get things done for me. And yet, going on 50 this year, nothing. Why should I trust, and no disrespect again, a bunch of men who was paid by the government to come and tell me it's going to happen? If we'll ask Dr. Farrell just to, to repeat some of the things you said in your opening remarks, and um, I, will, I will respond to you, Tony, but in a little while, as we go along. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> um, well, I think for the benefit of those who um, came in a little bit late, uh, I, I pointed out at the start that we, this, this is in fact, and we make no secret about it, this is in fact the fifth attempt at changing the Constitution, reforming the Constitution, since we got the 1976 Constitution. Uh, we, we make no secret about that. I think those of us here at the head table, and I think the entire uh, our committee, are very conscious of the, 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 the failures that have taken place over the course of the last 50 years. The way in which we look at it is that the fact that every administration, NAR, UNC, PNM that has come into office has made an attempt to, to reform. And 
you, some people may think that it's a political ploy, it's a joke. Maybe it is. We are not politicians here. Well, some of us are ex-politicians. Um, but we are not politicians up here. The, 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 the way we look at it is that the reason why it's being done, it is because there is a perceived need for change. What a constitution does, what a constitution is, is that it sets up a set of institutions. It sets up, as uh, Mr. Rez articulated in his presentation, it sets up an executive, it sets up a parliament, it sets up a judiciary. And it structures those institutions in a particular kind of way to work in a particular kind of way. The problem for us, as we see it, is that the institutions that we have, our friend here mentioned um, the service commissions. The service commissions in Trinidad and Tobago were actually established before independence by the British. It is the British who instituted service commissions in Trinidad in the 1950s. We incorporated it into the 1962 independence constitution and then we incorporated it back again into the 1976 constitution. We are in 2024 operating a public service with an institutional structure that was designed by the British for us in the 1950s. That is the reality. Now, the, 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 the thing is that we can say, and as I said, I am not a politician, so I, like you, look at what our politicians do and don't do. Uh, we can say, as our politicians do, that the problem is that party in power, that they're not running the thing right. But the fact that every single party that's come into power has this, made an attempt to reform the Constitution is telling us that it, maybe it is true that the people who run the institutions are not doing a good job, but maybe it is that the institutions themselves are badly designed, they are not fit for purpose for us in 2024. And going forward, they're not fit for purpose for us, for our children and for our grandchildren going forward. And that is where the, 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 the drive for reform is coming from. The politicians realize it, they understand it. How they deal with it in terms of making it happen has been the problem, which is why we are on the fifth attempt at trying to do this. The, the way in which it can happen, in, in, in my view, and I'm not here speaking for, for, the, for the other members of, uh, of the committee because we have not talked about this before, but the way in which it can happen is if the people of Trinidad and Tobago on this occasion say to the government and say to the political parties that we, the people, want these changes. And how can that happen? There is a way for it to happen. In other words, the, 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 the notion of our giving a report to the cabinet and the cabinet going to the parliament and trying to make it happen, it's just probably going to fail again because the opposition is going to block it. And when they come into power, they will try it again and the opposition is going to block it. But if there is a process that inserts the people before Parliament decides on the Constitution, which is many countries have done it. France has done it, other countries have done it, where you have a constituent assembly. That is to say, you bring people together. Delegates are sent by political parties, by civil society organizations and so on, to a constituent assembly with the report that comes out of this process, and that assembly decides on what it wants to see in the Constitution and instructs the Parliament that this is what we want. The people would have spoken and the Parliament would be very, very, uh, how should I put it? They wouldn't be wise to ignore the voice of the people in such circumstances. So that's what I want to have to say. The, the, to make the difference on this occasion, it is going to have to get the people of Trinidad and Tobago inserted into the process. It has not happened on the previous occasions, on all the previous occasions. Get the people inserted into the process so that parliament can be instructed. That's my thought. There may be other thoughts, and we would love to hear what your views are in terms of the process by which it could happen. Thank you. Yeah, we have. Good night again. Yes, there's only but one God, and his mercies endure forever. Now, there's a reason why the brother would be angered 
And uh, who had this young brother, the older man, he gave a nice presentation. I think one of the things in the reformation of the Constitution, in terms of the language of the Constitution, I think that's what should be able to make a constitution real for us. You know, when you hear Americans speak about the constitution, they can tell you plain what chapter one, two, three, four, five means. We just have to hire consultants and constitutional lawyers just to find out between me, shall, and what. So, one of the form is really in terms of what the IOC was in terms of making it beneficial. The language has to be where everybody, because as um, Jaima just said, in terms the people must be involved. And once the language is where the people could understand what is said and what is, is identifying with, they could relate it. Kamala said somehow the Constitution doesn't really reflect the people of Trinidad and Tobago, but it just reflects our system of laws. And as we said in 1976, what they got from 1956 from somebody because it was a constitution to govern people. It was not a constitution to be elevating or evolving the people. Because if we could say now in 2024, where Trinidad is, is like if we're still in 19 or 1808. Because something is wrong. There's no community again. There's no society. There's only different institutions trying to find a problem for a solution. So you have community development, but it's still a con community under development. You have national security, but you still have insecurity. But it's Trinidad and Tobago we live in. So the same person who's committing the crime is the same family to the person who's trying to catch the person who's committing the crime. But if we understand the Constitution, and we understand how we can move forward. As I said, there's a problem with the public service commissions. There's never really a problem. It's just there's confusion in the language as to what is the role of the public service. We saw it with the, the um, police service commission. Okay, and a big investigation because everybody is not sure what the constitution and what is whose role and what is really required. So in terms of, I understand my brother, in terms of what are you looking at, but that is where if we understand the language of the Constitution and there's something that is not going in the right direction, there is avenues in the Constitution where there can be matters dealt with without having to be, you know, reaching that temper of, of argument. Right? I'll rest it for now. Okay, thank you. Any other points of view? Yeah. Pleasant good night to the head table. My name is Nigel White. Um, I'm just glad to know, we, again, we're talking constitutional reform. My question is also, um, how much of the citizens are trying to big, even though we have a constitution they know about? Because I feel this is not, each citizen should at least have a copy of a constitution. So in the home, that they could go through. Today, they might tell them, go, on, look on, go up and look up on page so, 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 or go on this Google, or go on this site. You might tell them that. To get that, but I feel every house should start with having a couple of constitution so they could know what is their right. And I also understand that we said um, as the fifth time there's an effort. Well, I don't know if it's a change really, or if there's a, a discussion or a talk about changing constitution, right? When I look around the, here, I don't know if this, this meeting represents we was in point. So when we go back with the information today, we go and say, well, we have a point, and from point, well, it had one man from Grapo, one man from Capitaville, one man from the, and that def, um, reflects the general perspective of representation of people in point. I don't know if that, that will say that, right? And these are some of the concerns we have. But I, 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 I realize that politicians do interfere with the Constitution because it works for them. It works in their favor, you know. And if I used to ask from the head table, how much of the head table has advocated strongly for constitutional reform in the past, that today a team is put in place, you know, sometimes uh, somebody like me may wonder if it's another job that is given. Because I have seen government have put teams in place and they have bought 
information, proposals, and they will put on the back burner. I mean, we have to be real. So it's not about whether or not who, who we support. And if we want the country to go forward, right, as a people, we must start by saying the things that are real. So yes, we will pass it tonight. And some of my people might have nice ideas. But then someone do care after that. Because I will wait to see what happens to this information after election in 2025. Because I realize governments go and come. When coming to elections, they come with all the bright ideas that few people want to talk about. And put them in that state of, you know, frenzy. And then after that, they kick the can down the road again. Right? Um... Right. In terms of structure, we, we may mention about the constitution in terms of different structures and in terms of the judiciary system, the, this system, that system. But as a citizen, they are not, these systems don't stand alone. Because I, I notice politicians intervene in all these systems. They have a say in all these systems. They use up their authority over all these systems to have their way. So how, as a small man, me, how would, what is my direct justification? This is sound good, but how is it going to affect all of us here? How much of us really understand that based on what happens here in terms of the Constitution, how is it going to affect us? I see we talk about better. I said that thing here. Um, to the Constitution is the law that states how to Tobago is to be governed, right? And to identify branches of the government and the limits of their power. But we have a government in this country here that they have no limit to their power. They do what they want. They interfere with every ambit, every ambit of, of the different aspects of this country. And to those of us who doesn't understand how it affects us, it's only when we show them to us. And we are affected. So today, we are arguing against the system in terms of bail, who gain bail and who criminal gain bail. And some of us vex because we feel the judges and them or the lawyers and the magistrates doing crazy. But that's until one of our family go to court and deny bail, and then we have a problem with how they deny we bail. So I'm saying sometimes based on what shoes fit in our foot as people, we argue. But if we're talking constitutional reform, we have to look holistically at all of us and how this thing is going to benefit all of us or affect all of us because the constitution could change and get so drastic for all of us that we'll be asking ourselves what's going on here. You know? Because the government could come and say we had consultation and we was in Point Fortin, we was in Faisabad, we was in San Fernando and you the people contributed towards this. So we didn't do this alone. So we must be careful also that anything that has been identified or documented must come back to the people before it go forward. Because when we talk here, interpretation might go a different way. They might write it differently, and they might carry it forward. But the people who are here today must be able at some time to see, okay, what are the recommendations that are being made, and whether how that recommendation is going to work for me or against me. Because I noticed today in this country, if I support the PNM and the PNM do anything, I have no problem. If I support the UNC and the UNC do anything, I have no problem. So it had nothing to do with citizen, whether or not it's a citizen, and how it is, it's going to affect all of us. Because some of us feel because we are supporting a particular party, we are sheltered. That is until it comes knocking at your door. So again, you know, as we go forward, um, again, when we look at what's going on here, half, the, more than half the people here is members of the corporation or the certain um, positions, where are the people? Was this advertised in the way it's supposed to be advertised to get the people to come to really view you as they should? I don't know. I heard about it last night. I said, I'll come down here and hear what's going on and give me two cents. Thank you very much. Have a blessed night. Thank you. Any other? Yes, we have a hand over here. Good night, everyone. Um, Bernadette Bacchus, 
um, employee of the Point Fourteen Borough Corporation. <clears throat> um, I had only one question um, or comment, but um, based on all that was said, you know, in terms of the layman, it would have been good to know from a starting point how has the Constitution failed our country. Now, I know perhaps over time there would have been writings in the newspaper on various aspects of where the Constitution would have lacked. So that is a body of information that needs to be looked at, and it would have happened over from 1976, let's start there, to now. So now you get a good sense as to your compass in terms of being able to look at those areas. Um, we are already, on, we know that we are patterned with respect to the UK laws. And one thing with the UK laws is that um, they, their laws have evolved beyond what they left us. Um, so if you find, you find that when we would have had the introduction of our OSH Act, for instance, there would have been those people in the OSH that could have said that, you know, it would have been good to have this aspect patterned against a UK because they have gone beyond in terms of what they cater for. People in construction might have said, you know, if the laws catered for this, but the UK has gone beyond that. So we have the template, but we haven't done much with the template. And whereas you may have had revisions and so on, there are some things that would have fallen through the cracks. I'll use a local example where we, at the corporation, we're looking at local economic development, we're looking at, at perhaps, um, the minister last week spoke about giving, um, looking at finding boots and so on, which the, 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 the corporation already has. But then the fee structure, we are limited by those laws from when we would have had the initial laws. So if we have to move forward, it means then that there are things that may have emanated from various corporations to change certain things, and yet they have not been changed. Um, what would have caused those things? That's another idea. I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I wouldn't go into all of, of, of those areas. Um, also, there has also been a body or bodies of work that would have been generated by subject matter experts, politicians, um, activists that really speak of reform and it has either been chucked, another administration come again, it's chucked. So there's no layering of good ideas, no best practice. So best practice may have been introduced by a particular administration and chucked. That again means then that we are not really progressing when we speak of progressing, but not honing and embracing a best practice, which is what the UK laws, that's what they do. They look at their government agencies, they look at how their staff work, and they keep an eye out. I don't know if they have someone just looking just for best practice, and that's how they layer their progression um, in terms of how things evolve. Um, I'll give an example. One, the gentleman spoke of um, the boundaries and separia and so on. So there was a body of work, work that was done to look at the boundaries of point 14. So point 14 is a subset of the constituency. Essentially, that's what it is. And so I am on one side of the road and the other side is in separia. So it means then that if the DMU Disaster Management Unit has to respond to something in point 14 to traverse all of that, to come to respond to a matter, or the police who cannot school a, a, a vendor on the other side of the, of the road, which is two seconds away, it means then that how is that working for Saparia when they're in point 14? So they did a body of work in terms of relooking re -looking boundaries because they are closer. So under the election and boundaries part, there are some practical things, but then 
you know, the political side might be votes and so on, you know. But in terms of responding to needs of the people, that's what it is. If we have, if someone has to get something cleaned, is it that the borough is going to neglect a drain just across the road when it's actually causing flooding on the other side of the road? So I guess those are things where the local government comes in because they have a closer eye. And you do need, I'm an advocate, you do need a closer eye as to what goes on into the community. Um, and, and one other point in terms of the public service, you know, um, the model is, it's, it's not about generating mud, uh, money, but the public service, there are those who have adopted private sector approaches within the public service. You're not, and there is some inconsistency when you operate as a private sector person, but you may have an outlook from a private, from a private perspective. I worked in one such ministry, and the PS of that ministry had a total different look in terms of how a ministry should operate. So I ju I'm just saying that we have a particular template. There are, there are different ways to use what you have. But at the end of the day, we need to know what every idea, every idea you could think about, how reform can help in going forward. And if at all, we have to look at those laws of the UK that has evolved, we may be able to pick some things out of those things to bring us up to a certain standard or do away with everything or see how they may have repurposed the public um, service, the service commissions because it still exists. What is new that we have not yet done? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other? Yes. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands, so yes, I can come back to you. For, uh, remember, it, it, we look at five minutes. Okay. So. Thank you very much again, moderator. And um, um, the reason why I came back again is because this topic of um, amending or reforming the Constitution it really and truly interests me. And my last point was regarding um, um, utilizing new public um, management models within the public service to ensure that it continues to be efficient, relevant, and consistent to, to our needs as a, as a society. One of the main things that require adjustment I believe is uh, um, the inclusion of a local government within the constitution itself. Now, of course, the government has a robust agenda to reform local government to ensure that there is much more effectiveness in all of the boroughs and cities and corporations. But I would go a bit further for there to be its inclusion, similar to how TH is included in the constitution, for there to also be the reform element as well. So that when the reform for local government is passed and proclaimed, well, not passed, but proclaimed rather, in this full sense, you would not risk another government coming in to remove it and to bring back the level that we um, elevated from in the first place. And I would even go further to say that the same way how we want to, of course, um, change the public service, um, that some of the elements in those commissions be subsumed within the local government authorities. I don't think it is, it is fair or effective for a teacher. You, you know, we know we need a, a teacher in Point Putin West Secondary School, but, it, but you must wait for five persons in the Port of Spain to make an acting appointment and, of course, that takes a long time, and our students are suffering the most. Instead, that, could, that role could be played by the corporation, by the borough, by the city, on placing teachers in, in, in schools, in, of course, having much more decentralized services in your corporations, so that there wouldn't be a need for departments of paper in Port of Spain to be piled up. So I will go a bit further to expand local government um, and their duties to 
include some of those elements in the service commissions so that there can be much more effectiveness and better service. Because remember, new public management calls for um, public entities operating business-like. We don't make money in the public service, but you provide service. So your profit would be how your people are able to um, receive the services from your um, department. And that is what I think should be um, included in expanding the role of local government and codifying it in the actual constitution, similar to THA, so that there is protection for all the corporations. My final point, thank you. Thank you. Any other um, contributions? Yes, we have over there. Pleasant good evening to the head table and pleasant good evening to everyone assembled here. Um, to the head table, I want to welcome you to the Borough of Sorrow. Firstly, my name is Garnet Thompson. I have been a Burgess of Point Fourteen all my life. I've been a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago all my life. And before I go into what I want to say, I want to congratulate the mayor, the MP, and the councillors that are present here tonight. Reason being, a few years ago, when it was the People's Partnership in office, I didn't see them here in local government reform. And they were councillors, some of them, but they weren't here to bring the information to the Burgesses who they represent. But I'm happy to see them here tonight, and I'm hoping that they will carry the message, be good stewards, and carry the message to their Burgesses in their various constituencies so that people will understand, educate their people on what is one, constitutional reform, two, local government reform, and why we should have it. It is not supposed to be a fanfare because I or my party wasn't in office or not in office, so me and come into that. And I could say some things here that maybe people might want to tell me they lie, or sorry, I lie, but I wouldn't. Because the last mayor at that time, he did not time with local government reform. I'm happy, I am not one with big words. I am, I am limited with words. So I don't know big words, I am not Trinidad Rio. However, it may seem to a lot of people in Point Fortin and throughout Trinidad and Tobago that when we talk local government reform and we talk national government reform in terms of the constitution, it is a, just a talk, just a mimic, just a talk show. I too, as an individual, are just here tonight because I only hear about it today because somebody sent it on a chat. And it's not supposed to be like that. Even the very team that is in front of us, I don't know what work you have put in in letting the citizens know. I would have seen an ad last night while in the, in the TV6 News was going on, on constitutional reform, and I say, what? They have that, that going on? And then today, I see that we have a meeting in point. And I say, well, boy, I had to come and welcome all to the borough of sorrow because we cannot be talking constitutional reform, and as the goodly young man said, and I mean, using the words very eloquently, we can't have constitutional reform without local government reform. But this very same crop of councillors was not here when we were talking about electricity increase in this very, this very ground that we stand in here. So I don't know what is the game we're playing. I am living Point Fortin, and they're fixing a road right next to me and wouldn't fix the piece of road to come by me because I don't support the People's National Movement. Am I not a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago? And we talking constitutional reform? Something had to be wrong with that. We playing games. And if we want to play games, then I will just go over the road, right over the road, and go in the savannah and play a game. We're not supposed to be playing games with people's life. 
This is serious, serious business. Most of you gentlemen in front there, I have great respect for you. The ones that I would know. The ones that I would listen to. The ones that I would see from time to time. You don't know the impact you may have on people's lives. But people do listen to you. And when it comes in to constitutional reform, we must not be playing games. When you put in your face to something, it must be serious because people... I heard the remark earlier on, well, some of us might be retired politicians. I'm not into politics. Everything we do in Trinidad and Tobago has to relate with politics. It was a political decision to close down Petrotrin and Trinma. Today I am out of a job because of that. And everybody in Point Forte normal. I ain't hear mayor, councillor, MP, nobody say, Rowley, you're making a bad decision. But one man have the power in his hands. Is this constitutional reform committee going to take away that power? And as, as was read a while ago, limit the power so this one man cannot destroy thousands of lives? If that happens, then we could understand that this constitutional reform will make sense. But if that don't happen, we wasting time, we spinning top in mud just like all the other times. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Any further contributions? See a show of hands. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this guy. Evening again, folks. Um, I heard the gentleman, they made some statements about politics. And I am here because I'm a rooted how to say it, young leader who was brought up in Point Fortin, where my roots is rooted in Trimmer, right? I learned my, my secrets from Trimmer when it came to oil and gas, right? I know what we country have, right? As I said, ref putting referendum as a law in Trinidad and Tobago, because we, do, we don't have that in the Constitution, Right? Somebody will come and they will do what they call them thing. The, everybody take a signature. They create it to the parliament. They go through some special door they have now. And then it is shown in the dustbin or whatever happens state, right? We see Philip Alexander try it with um, the Andrea Barrett situation and so on. So that is a waste of time. Protesting is a waste of time. The people at Trinidad and Tobago needs to have the power in their hand. Yes, I vote you in. Yes, I vote the men. Yes, I vote the MP in. But the people needs to have the power in their hand, right? Your office would have reached out to me on certain things, and I told them, I don't want to see reform of sentences. I think the Constitution is about what? 300 and something pages the last time I downloaded. And it's full of holes. It protects the politicians. It enriches the rich. It creates and, and how to say it, flusters corruption. And if... When I look at my community, brother, crime, drugs, murders, gangsters controlling the local seafront, but the Prime Minister don't know where guns and ammunition are coming from. Police collecting envelope and moving drugs and guns, but nobody know in high authority why we have out of control crime. And this is what I'm saying. Show me all the serious, right? Don't wait for 2025. Show me by September month this thing going forward. Show me by September month that changes happen and that the, 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 the referendum in this constitution is made some type of law policy where we get back the power. So, as my brother say, when certain people who feel that because I'm a minister and I'm this and that and I could walk on your head or walk on your children's head, we could now rely on that referendum pull a vote and say either the Prime Minister stay or he goes. We could pull a vote and say either the Mayor stay or he goes. We could pull a vote and say either the MP stay or he goes. Show me all I could get that done. Show me by September this moving on and I will see all the not on bullshit. Excuse me, my language. Yeah, we have right here. 
take the first time ones. Pleasant evening, everyone. I just want to make a, um, oh, my name, Kennedy Richards. I remember our parliament, point four. I just want to make a few, a few um, comments. Um, first, firstly, um, I want to also echo um, what Mr. White would have said in terms of the advertising. I know it's, 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 we, we need to gather some peace with where the ref, um, constitutional reform is. But I think a lot of people were not aware of, of it, even though the mic sort of gone out today and stuff like that, and maybe the weather would have held back a, a, a few people. We have some, some really good contributions thus far. Um, young Kobe Sandy would have talk, spoken about um, local government reform. I guess people would have come. That's something that is necessary. We all know that um, local government is not enshrined in the Constitution. But I think, sitting here and I'm listening, I think a lot of people are missing what is actually taking place here. We have, as somebody would say, subject matter experts and somebody brightest minds in the country, the ability going around and seeking, you know, um, seeking su um, suggestions from the, from the average man in the country as to what they would like to see changed in the Constitution. But before we get to the change, we must understand what the Constitution is and how it affects us. I think uh, Mr. White would have said that. So that is something that, so we can't come here and understand that, and sorry, and say that this is a PNM thing, or this is a UNC thing, or this is a mayor thing, or this is a MP thing, or this is not a political thing. Oh, everything in this country, as somebody said before, has some type of political ramifications with it. But we must understand that the Constitution is going to affect us in one way or the other. Because the Constitution is basically the laws of the land. And the gentlemen in front here cannot change the Constitution. They are charged with the responsibility to come up with... with... A, with, 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 with with a paper, with a document that they can put forward that can be changed. So when you give them a deadline in September to come up with a, with a referendum and... Wait, wait, wait. You had, a, you had an opportunity to speak. You had an opportunity to speak. Have a seat. Have a seat. Excuse me. Excuse Have a seat. Excuse me. Excuse me. Have a seat, hello, hello. please. Excuse me. You, you, excuse me. Excuse me. He's on the floor. So, okay. Okay. All right. Sit down, my man. Sit down and relax yourself, my man. Yeah. So, the gentlemen are, 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 not, are not charged with changing the Constitution. And we must understand why we are here so that we can be effective. Right? This is, this is about ensuring that when they come, they was in Grandy last night. They left the, the Northeast and they came to Point Four, which is in the Southwest, two furthest ends of the country. And we want to really get the best out of it. So, you, so you want to, to, to really give your thoughts, your views, how you want to see change, what you want to see change. Some people, people spoke about local government. People spoke about the crime situations. People spoke about all of that. Right? All these things are things that, if you go into the Constitution, which you downloaded and you say that there's about 300 and something pages, you have an opportunity to, to, to hopefully read it and then come and say, listen, on this page, I saw this, and I felt as though this should be changed. Because the Constitution is our old document. And, and, and now, and now, we are in 2024. So from then, from that time, so about 1962 some, to now, a lot has changed. And we see the, the need, the government sees the need to actually have the constitutional reform. No, we could have gone and make it and make changes for themselves. But how does that affect you? You have an opportunity, you now everybody here has an opportunity to input what you would like into the constitution, into the constitutional change, into the working document. And then it goes back to where it needs to go, and then it will have a vote, and it will have go through that entire process. We can't say that this process is going to take two months, or it's going to take two years. Who knows? But I'm hoping that the views of everyone here is considered and brought forward to where it needs to go. All right? Um, just, just, one more just one more thing. This thing where, where, where one man destroying people's lives and stuff like that. And I, I could understand that People are, are, are grieved and, and, and people are affected by decisions. And you are going to be affected by whatever decisions that a politician make. And that's the point I've been here tonight. So I, I take no offense when somebody say that we didn't do this or this one do this or this one mash up this place and all that kind of thing. 
But what I what, what we take what I would take offense to is when they said that they are, they, the MP was a council at that time, which is true. And we didn't speak about local government reform. Because you could ask any regional corporation, any CEO, from when, when local government reform started back in the day, point 14, under Mayor Clyde Paul, at that point in time, took the lead where local government reform was concerned. And maybe I, I, I gave a little bit of a contribution later on after more people speak, but that's basically it. And I just, I just want people in point 14 to understand that we're not here to, to talk about politics and who you like and who you don't like. The Constitution are the, are the laws, and the laws, are af the laws affect every single person. Whether you like the PNM, you don't like the PNM, whether you like the UNC, you don't like the UNC, whether you like MSG, you don't like MSG, or whether you like the brother, uh, party, or you don't like it, right? The laws are going to affect you. So you have an opportunity tonight to stand up and let the head table know what it is you would like to change, what it is you would like to see changed, right? And maybe when they come back, because Mr. White alluded to that point, and I think they should come back eventually after they have the working document with what has changed and stuff like that and, and, and give us some type of update. Maybe that's in the process, I don't know. But that is something that, that needs to be happened so that we can have an opportunity now to go through the document that they would have brought back. And those who didn't read the Constitution before, go through it so that they could see what the changes and how the changes are going to affect you. Because if anything changes, it's either going to affect you positively or negatively. But it's not going to remain the same. Right? So when you wake up tomorrow morning, God spare life, you may not be the same as you were yesterday. And that's something that we must understand. Change is constant. Right? And we, we all to come here tonight and give our views. Whether you believe you're political or not, the opportunity is yours tonight in Point 14 to ensure that your views are heard. Thank you. Thank you. There's a gentleman here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to you. Evening again. Mr. MP, you seem you don't know what really going on here, or focus on what's going yeah, on here. Just... Right? But I'll come off of that. As I said, folks, right? We're in a very, how to say it, sticky situation, right? And I'm standing by my words. Show me something that standing by September that we go in somewhere. We know that all they here to take what all they need to take to whoever going to get this done. I know how the Constitution will affect us, especially 300 and something pages that I read over and over that is just a, a basket that don't hold water that keeps politicians in corruption strong, that protects them from going to jail, right? That gives them the power to make the dumbest set of decisions in this country. And I, I, I will say again, and I'm trying to imprint it in all the brain. Referendums, will protect the people, will protect my children, will protect my community from the politicians who are corrupted. Right now, corruption is the problem. Corruption is the problem. And we have a constitution protecting them. Not the people. I want more vote. Um, Mr. Marvin, no, you could use your... You thank you, to... thank you, thank you, moderator. My brothers and sisters, it is really a, a great pleasure for me to be in your midst tonight as a member of this committee. I used to be a politician until 1991. And my last position in public office, I was Speaker of the House of Representatives, and that was in 1991. But prior to becoming uh, a politician in 1976, in 1959, I got my first government job as a primary school teacher in point 14, and I was one of the pioneer teachers who founded the Muslim school in point 14 
in a shed that was built next to the mosque. And until the new facility, which exists up to today, um, was built and we moved over. The time I spent there, I was embraced by small island people in Point Fourteen. I lived at Beach Road in Point Ligo. I lived amongst the fisher folk there. And even today, when I visit Point Fourteen, I feel as if I am part of Point Fourteen. I make this point because I believe that Point Fourteen has been a melting point, a melting pot rather, for total assimilation of all our peoples in Trinidad and Tobago. God is my witness. And that is what Constitution is all about. It is the foundation piece of legislation in any civilized democracy for people to build their relationships upon. And we have had successive constitutions in Trinidad and Tobago. And we have heard from Dr. Farrell that the successive governments have tried, and this is the fifth attempt, and previous attempts got almost nowhere. We have described the Republican Constitution in 1976 coming out of the Wooding Commission as a sort of a cosmetic fix-up in 1976. So the fact of the matter is that whichever government is in office has realized that the Constitution is not moving in tandem or together with the development of the society. And as a result of that, governments suffer serious and severe handicaps as they seek to govern the country. And this is something that we have to understand. The basis of governing our country is our constitution. And secondly, that government is a science. There is a structure for within which any government will have to operate. And that structure is rocking. It is not working. And that is why our brother Anthony is reflecting a kind of anger that we have in our country. And I want to thank him for coming back and sitting to continue our uh, discussions here tonight. So you are, he is not alone in that regard. Some have gone beyond that level of anger. Many are very angry. Many are dissatisfied. Hopelessness is overtaking us. But guess what? Others have gone beyond this kind of anger, my brother. And you know what? They have abandoned the system that we are trying to fix. And they are now, they are now inventing their own system. And they have taken matters into their own hands. And they are, in fact, developing their own system of government, which makes us prisoners in our homes. We're living in jail. We are afraid. And we do not know where to turn. People are holding their bellies, mothers, and they are begging, put down the guns, put down the guns. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you here tonight, not a single one of us here has any political interest in any political party. 
We are here for Trinidad and Tobago, and I want you to accept that. It just happens that Dr. Keith Rowley, who happens to, the prime, to be the prime minister at this time, here he has realized that something has to be done to the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, and he's trying with us, and we are telling you we have no political interest in any political party. We are just messengers taking what the people say. My brother in the back, um, I think, uh, is it Nigel? I think my brother Nigel in the back there. He, he, he was telling us about, he believes that everybody in this country should have a copy of the Constitution. And, you know, that is a very fundamental point because we are having a problem as a committee. And you know what is our problem? We cannot get mass support for what we are doing. Last night we were in Grandi. I was on a, on a program, some Zoom program that they had internationally talking about constitutional reform on Sunday. And somebody from the university said, um, they, they, uh, we are wondering whether this is a political gimmick, what you all are doing concerning constitution reform. You see, we don't trust ourselves anymore because we can't trust each other. And as a result of that, we are not getting the kind of mass support. Somebody said the way this meeting was arranged, brothers, sisters, in the newspapers, on the television, we have asked um, officers to come down here. I, I think I have made a courtesy call on the telephone to His Worship the Mayor, and I said, Mr. Mayor, Your Worship, see what you could do. Bring out the people, let us have, because people give up. They give up, Brother Anthony. So listen, what I believe has to happen is that we have to make things happen. We cannot allow our country to fail because we have that responsibility to avoid us going down that path. When we, when we submit our uh, report to the, to the government, you know what that report will be? An overview of what has transpired during the time we have given and we will compile no less than 200 um, written submissions have come to our secretariat to date, and they are continuing to come in. That will be compiled, that will be submitted. Reports of these meetings, like this one here and the one in Sangri Grandi yes, last night, a report will be given. So don't think that you, you have come here, my, my dear friend, and you have wasted your time. It, is, it will be left to the government to move it forward. And we don't, wouldn't have any say in that. But if we, the people, can put aside for one moment or a little period of time, put aside our partisan political interests and look at Trinidad and Tobago, and it can happen. It can happen. What is the best thing to happen for Trinidad and Tobago? And we put aside our political interests, we'll get good answers. So this is our position. One of the tragedies in Trinidad and Tobago is that we have not taught government as a science in the schools. When I was a little boy, and it's a long, long time now, when I was a little boy, do you know something? We, they used to teach us a subject called civics in primary school, in primary school. But in no schools, I have an idea like what Brother Nigel talked about, copies of the Constitution. I didn't put it to the committee, but I said, I wonder if we can get private, um, private enterprise to sponsor the printing of copies of the Constitution and spread it all over the place and give it to people and see whether, just share it out in addition to all the pamphlets and all the flyers and whatever, whatever we have done in order to, to advertise what we, are, um, what we are doing. So, brothers and sisters, 
or we have come to listen to you. And the purpose of me just intervening at this stage, I want just one favor. And that is, can we trust each other? Can we start trusting each other? Can we put aside all this, this thing about the, 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 the political thing and look at Trinidad and Tobago? I am telling you, there is a new kind of government that is brewing up in this country and it is all about guns and violence that my brother is talking about. He started up, the first word that came out his mouth without a sentence was corruption. Corruption. The system allows for it. It is a constitution that will correct something like that. My, my friend, moderator, thank you um, for allowing me the time. And let me just say, one of the reasons why we have, he's not a member, the moderator is not a member of our committee. We decided we want someone who is not um, involved in the work that we are doing to do, to, to do this exercise for us. And that is why he is the moderator. And other meetings, we'll have other moderators. If, we, if, if, if any one of you can get 20, 30 people to come together, whether it is Ikakas or Sidras or wherever, and you just tell us, we will come. If seven of us can, or eight of us in the committee, if eight of us cannot come, three, four of us, we will come. We will take what you have to, what the people have to say, and we will go back and we will send in whatever we um, we gather in our report. So, as I say, all I ask is, let us trust each other for the sake of Trinidad and Tobago. Let us trust each other. You know something? When I dro drove in here, I looked at opposite. I might be mistaken. I think that place used to be called Mahaika Oval. I don't know if it is true. No, lower down. That way. Oh, it's not there. Right. That was the first time, that was the first time I heard the mighty Duke sing Calypso. That was before he went to the tent in Port of Spain. Is that the Mayaika Oval? Never forget that. Brothers and sisters, we have the capacity. We have the capacity and the people of Point 14 over the years, you have laid the foundation. I am appealing to you, and I hope you understand. God bless all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mohammed, for your um, intervention. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Farrell wants to get a clarification from someone. No, from, from Anthony. Is it Anthony? Is it, is it Anthony? Yeah. Uh, you, 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 you keep saying, uh, you keep asking about a referendum. Um, and I just want to be clear that that is what you mean or whether you mean the power, the, 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 the power of the referendum in the Constitution. No, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, do you mean a referendum or do you mean the power of recall? That is to say, referendum can also be recall. it can't. Yes. Uh, and recall. Camera. Ca camera. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, but uh, Cameron uh, lost the a referendum. No, Prime Minister but, David Cameron resigned yeah. because he, he lost the Brexit referendum. Yeah. No. 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 The, no, there was a referendum in 2016 mm -hmm. on whether the United Kingdom should remain in the United, in Europe or withdraw from the European Union. Right, and as a consequence of the referendum going in favor of Brexit, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, resigned. And Theresa May became the Prime Minister. She then resigned, and Boris Johnson became the Prime Minister. His, no, his MPs turned against him. Yeah, his yeah. MPs turned against him, and he stepped down, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, I think, so I, I think I think so. Just, just to be clear, the, the, because there, there are two things. One is, and, and, and I'm just 
Right. So, so several people, by the way, in terms of the, the, the submissions that we've had, have asked for the same thing that you're asking for, and the, the, the question of recall. That is to say, recall, just, just for the benefit of, 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 the, of, the, of the folks here, is, is, a, is a mechanism which you can put into the Constitution whereby the, 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 the electorate in a constituency can petition to recall the person that they voted and put into parliament. Okay? That's called the power of recall. Yeah. Um, and, and I think... Right. That, that is correct. So you can have a referendum. Yes. Yes. C correct. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. I think I okay, that's the clarification he wanted to get. Yeah. So just to, just to be clear, what you're seeing is that you would, you're suggesting a referendum on major public issues. Right. All right. Okay, I think they just wanted to get the clarification of, so it's major policy decisions. Okay, thank you. Right, any further um, comments? Yeah, someone had their hand up at the back. Just, yes, the gentleman here hasn't spoken as yet. Yeah, he had his hand up. Yeah, the, yeah it's coming to you. Go ahead. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to say something before you could just your, get a name and a general My name, name is Godfrey Alexander, Mr. Alexander. What I would like to say, we have a government in a government presently that we only the government at Trinidad and Tobago. And they are stifling everything. Even if you all set up a constitutional reform here, these are the people who are in power, who are running the government for the past 45 years stifling everything. So it come like, you all just, you know, it didn't make no sense. Because they are the people who are in power, who stifling everything. The government in our government that running the government at Trinidad and Tobago. That's all I want you all to know, that we have a serious problem with that. That, we need to reform that, get rid of that system in order to have a reform a constitution. Because we have a government that running the government, even the constitution. So what we will do about it? What the public could do? We cannot do nothing. Can we do something, Mr. Ghani? Nothing we cannot do because we, it's just a pawn. We don't have no say, nothing. Even if you reform anything or say anything starting, the police reform, we need a police reform too. In order to have the constitutional put together, we need a police reform. Reform the police service in order to carry on the law in a proper way. Because if the police service not reform, then we won't have a proper law in order. So the People who in running the government and a government running the police too. It's not the government that we elect running the system, you know. The government in a government running the whole police force, even the government. And all the MPs in Trinidad and Tobago run under them. We are no, we are aware of it. I am aware of it. I don't know if the public are aware of that system, but we have a problem. That is a big problem we have. So we need to reform the government in a government that running the government first in order to have a reform for the public. You understand? That is the problem we have in. If we reform that government day, you know what's going on for the next 10 years? Trinidad being stifled. We stifle everything, just stifle. One way it going, not the other. So the government need to get the act together first and tell us the truth 
that the government in a government running the government, what plans they have for them in order to get rid of them. You had to do drastic things and it's hard to get rid of them. Because they run in the country. They run in the country. So how you can get rid of somebody who run in the country and own everything in the country? You can't have no reform there. You had to bring them on the table here with us here. And them, them, then them go say, well, all right, here we're going on. And we could do this, we could do that, we could do that. If them in here, it didn't make no sense. You need to bring these people on board who run in the government. All you need to bring them on board. We know them, you know them, everybody know them. But they need to come on board with us in order to put things in place for us and yourself because they're greedy, you know. There's greedy people. There's self-opinionated people. And they don't care about me or you. Thank you very much for your kind courtesy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, right here. I'll tell him I help my brother here. I think he's trying to say make sure there's an inclusion in financial, what is it called, electoral financing. Yeah, I'll tell you that what he's trying to say, but you know, he did, you know. <laughs> but I tell my brother Nizam, I'll say, I'll, I'll say welcome home in point. Um, as my brother saying in terms of one of the things, as I was saying earlier, well, the MP has now come. I think as what the brother was asking and what, the brother suggested in terms of we as a people should always find our own self to meet, invite our MPs, our councillors, as the brother said, put the trust to get the details or put the trust for the community. And so when the MPs or the councillors go out to represent us, they represent us on our behalf. This is what I said when I use the term that Although we're independent, we still have our capital is still the port of Spain. That means there's something that we don't want to let go. And I think that is a kind of personal space. We have been struggling as a community just because we would not sit together. I saw Risha, I was going to mosque with my brothers, I was going to Baptist church with my sisters. Others going to eat Pentecostal, everybody. Because it's one God. He didn't say a particular name, one God, but not going religious. He's just saying, if we find ourselves with the one cause, whatever vexation, whatever problem, we put away those feelings for the cause. Because as I said, the Constitution is supposed to represent the people. Then aspects of the Constitution or certain policies in how to administrate certain facilities for the people to be, I would say, to have water, light, and the services that I was asking about in terms of the institutions. But the, the, the core of the Constitution is supposed to be what identifies us as a people and what we are, how we live together, how we unite, how we, we, we fit in that melting pot. So even if you know there are those maybe a little too greedy and those who have very little, we're supposed to find within where in the Constitution the problem can solve because all the answers really supposed to be in the Constitution. Be it crime, hunger, utilities, services, it is in the Constitution. But as I said, we have to look at the language that we are using, make it that as if it goes to everybody in the citizens should have a constitution, they should be able to understand the basic principle that they could say, I stand on what? The First Amendment or I stand on the Fifth Amendment. When America said they know what they mean. So it's just that the language of the constitution really is where the problem is, but it also has to have us reflected in the constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at the back, is it? Gentleman behind, yes. Him, and then I'll take the one in front of it. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. All protocol observed. I want to see. I want to trust and trust. The name. My name is Ryan 
Lucas from Library. Trust, credibility, and having confidence in whoever is bringing that message is a problem. We are approaching the 20th anniversary where at that place that was demolished, the civic center, where commitment was made to shut down and dismantle train one in the interest of point four ten safety. A decision was taken because a question was asked concerning the worst case scenario, which turned out to be 2.5 kilometer radius, that point four ten wasn't prepared to accept and a decision was taken to shut down and dismantle train one, the mother train, the smallest train of the, the train family, in 20 years' time. The countdown for that 20 years started in 1999 and would have expired in 2019. To date, you and I have not heard anything pertaining to that. We have, had no, we, 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 we have heard other stories about a gas, a failed gas refilling program and not be made aware of the risk involved and the, the decision taken. Nobody say thanks to Point Fortin for taking the, the risk or say thanks to the Almighty for that period of, of windfall that we experienced. But we were all aware of the messages, the various messages that surround that gas curtailment, gas optimization, all kind of gas talk, teeth head thing, when a simple explanation, people of Trinidad and Tobago, train one no longer exists because a commitment was made to the Burgesses of Point Fortin. Trust and credibility. I ask the question, what is this about? Yes, we need constitutional reform, but there are several things that I experience and I have seen that bothers me and say, why now? Why now? And while, okay, yes, constitutional reform, what is there presently in the constitution that as, as, as even though we don't have a constitution, we, we all hearing that this needs to be changed, that needs to be changed, and we haven't probably all seen exactly what needs to be changed, what is the problem with this, so that we could better understand. Nonetheless, within the framework that we have available to us, is it a case of people mic micro micro micromanaging the thing to fail? Is it a case where human beings are intentionally causing madness, mayhem, anything, so that we will become frustrated and, 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 and lose confidence? It turn out, I don't know if it's that, but the guns coming into, well, before I go, before I go there, is it possible that Point Fortin has not reached its peak in oil production? Because we have all been told, well, there, there is a, a gas, a hydrocarbon crisis, and we're running out. When the truth is, who knows if it's the government inside our government, if the government has been bought out to sell me a, a, a story. The thing is very serious. They take 10, they negotiate 10%, and then they come in and ask the owners of the patrimony, for money for property tax. Why you not take it out of them? Why you not take 12%? Why you not take 30%? 10% is tides. That is the Lord own, and the rest is mine. So there has to be, let me say, there has to be a renegotiation of that arrangement. And because of that whole set of thing that took place, I have no, I, I believe that in law, that arrangement has no value. It should fail because it has been based on deception, trust, and credibility. How could I trust you? 
the, 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 just last night I picked up my phone and I went through the Public Service Commission regulation. A whole set of rules. A whole set of rules. Custom is short staff. Guns coming in the country. Two police commissioners highlight the fact that guns are coming through the legal ports of entry. The police, the National Security Council, the National Security Office, neither the Custom, the um, Service Commission, who is responsible for employing custom workers, in employing no custom workers, the short staff, they can't man the ports, and guns are coming in, and we don't know if it's Haiti guns. We don't know if it's guns assigned to kill Haiti now coming to China, to kill we, to kill us, to destroy us. What about the system that we have available to us? Is it being micromanaged to fail? Is it being hijacked? And we are forced now to stay around in a corner where we're in a crisis. Let us consider constitutional reform. My thing is, fix the thing. While we talk constitutional reform, fix what we have. Let what we have work for us. Let what we have shine. Right. There's another issue that I, 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 I think wisdom will require me to, not to go there. But I'll stop and say trust is very important. And is this system, is there uh, this reform similar to the RIC? The RIC, had, the RIC stepped out of its bound. The RIC, the RIC stepped out of its bound in two particular areas where the aluminum, where they entered the state, where the state entered into a take or, pay, take or pay arrangement to facilitate the aluminum smelter. And the aluminum smelter crash, and the RIC knows that. That take or pay should also crash, but they still continue to, 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 to allow that to, to stand, putting T and Tech in a disadvantaged position, now coming and telling us that we gain free thing and we need to pay for this. When they intentionally sabotage the thing, they intentionally set up the thing to fail. The, uh, up to now, the RIC hasn't even tell us nothing about the money they're collecting for research and development. When, what about the greenhouse gas? Is there value in the greenhouse gas? Is there value? Can, can energy, be, for, can energy be, be, be derived from the beta wastewater treatment plant? Was it designed to sell electricity to TNTEC? What about the dump? What a, can energy be derived from the dump? And, there, and I'm saying that because there seems to be an intention to pressure us, to break us, to drag us on the ground, to make us devalue our, 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 ourselves. And I'm saying, some, there is, is it just about, what we, is it just about, <laughs> intentional acts to intentionally create a crisis where there is none so that we could alter the thing. I, I, I would like to stop there, please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. You, you wanted to speak? Yeah, yeah. yeah, good night again, Nigel White. You know, I want to thank the brother that we gave you some very significant points. I think some things that some of us don't go into you know, in terms of the RAC and whatnot. And to Mr. Mohamed, um, I want to thank you, you know, for your, your, you know, your sentiments expressed there and the accent for trust. But trust is something that is earned. And statistically, if you look at the country, much doesn't be done by those in authority to earn my trust. I don't want the rest of people, but I got to talk about me. Not because they have been failing us by saying one thing and doing another. We have seen that. But I am making some point. How much are people in China and Tobago are being bought out that are no different and are not standing up for the rights only benefit of people in China and Tobago? What is subsidy? Does the people understand what is subsidy or what was subsidy? We talk about it so much at time. We see you talking about trust and country reform, but there are some things that are very critical that happened and continue to articulate in the country that makes us feel bad. 
as a citizen, like you're begging for something, you're getting free thing when it's already paid for. But who knows that? The resource of the country belongs to who? The people. But you feel like if you're a spoiled child, when you look for the benefits of it, when they tell you you're getting subsidized gas, you're getting subsidized electricity, subsidized water rate, and there's something that will happen in the other Caribbean countries. Who is going to tell the people the truth? You see, sometimes when you speak, some people, I mean, if you're talking reform, people, educate. You want to develop a country? Educate your people. And if you educate your people and keep them in a box, you'll continue to walk over them. And they will think that here what happening. They are getting the best. So you're peeing in the face and the same rain is falling. I'm saying, it hurts me. I do oppose for opposing sake. And I do not want to toe the line. But there are some things that I understand. But in speaking it sometimes to some of the other people, they may feel I'm just opposing for opposing's sake. But then why does the politician continue to make the people feel bad that they're getting things for free and they like freeness? And like that favor again. Why is Guyana, the people in Guyana being beneficiaries of the things in Guyana now? I mean, there are a lot of things we have to understand. As a people, Mr. Mohammed, if we the people have to come together, because the people must understand their power. We don't have a part of no constitution. The people hire, the people should know they, are, they could fire. We don't have a part of no constitution. The people must understand first and foremost that they employ the government. So we don't have a part of the constitution. But the people must know that. But we don't know that. They don't, they don't educate us about that. They don't teach our history in school. What is the history of Trinidad and Tobago? Is it taught in school? No. What was the importance of Petrochrin to the society? What, you, know, you know what they sell it as? A, 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 a fail, fail industry. They sell it to the population and they go the narrative. But our cash flow system is affecting us today. And the government only means, and, and sorry if I'm not, I just want to express because why we can't trust them. The government only means of getting revenues is to tax everything. You put something on Skybox, tax it. You spend a little lotto and it go over 12,000, tax it. You go in the bank and take in money over 10,000, the bank tax it. You go any property tax, pay away to, the, um, to 25 to 30%, 12.5% value of the tax, health surcharge. And, I, and then some foolish people, we don't like to pay taxes in this country. And that, and that narrative is being carried about. Where are the people that are educated in this country to defend the vulnerable who doesn't know better and sit down and take who they believe in that represents them that when they speak, they speak on their behalf. So we're talking about constitutional reform and we, we want to buy in. If we had 500 people here tonight, and we had 25 meetings with 500 people. And we multiply 25 <laughs> by 500. You know, you get about 12,000 something people, right? 12,000 something people out of 1.4 million cannot state whether or not we agree on constitutional reform or not. So, whether we had 500 in 25 meetings, it cannot articulate whether we had a general perspective of what is represented in terms of constitutional reform. So we're depending also on you, the people in the table, to know what is right and what is best for the citizenry of this country. That we will not be taken for granted because in some countries, the constitution that they have, we wouldn't like it here. So I'm saying is that if we are to me, that's played Mr. Mohammed. All of us must understand that this is not about a job. This is not about who you like. This is about the future. Not just your future, but your children's future. The neighbor's future, the children's future. Your children's children's future. Because I was all trying to say, today you might have 
Tomorrow somebody may, may, may not have. But when you have, they'll start to watch what you have to come with. A young lady sing a song there, then we like it too bad. Poverty is no excuse for crime. I mean, it's dance state. But I could say it in a, it sounds nice. But the reality is, when you're in poverty, wheresoever you get something to do, you're going to do it. So the song sang nice and we sang it and we say, oh God, but poverty is no excuse for crime and she tried to beat up on all who feel. But when you don't have, when you don't have, like a lot of people doesn't have. So again, we are depending on you guys up there, you gentlemen who are being placed to represent and this matter also to put some hard facts on the paper to assist in defending all of us here. Whether we feel what we represent or where we are, to defend all of us here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we have a... Thank you again. Um, just for the record, um, you mentioned that the, a report would be prepared, I would imagine that it would, you know, compile, as you say, all the, the information, um, perhaps recommendations, perhaps areas that were not touched. And are you able to tell us what then are the next steps beyond the report? What is the roadmap towards reform? Because I think it would be good for us to know what is the process that will follow so that everyone would get a clear idea that this is the end result. What's the outcome and the impact? Okay, I'll ask I, the um, chairman yeah, to... If I can answer you. This is the second meeting we are having. We are going through the 14 uh, municipalities in Trinidad, two in Tobago. We are gathering the views of the population. We will hear what you say. Try to, we will distill everybody's contributions, be it oral or written, and our mandate is to prepare a term, terms of reference for a national consultation. We have a deadline up to, I think, June. The deadline is June. We will present our report, which would be the terms of reference, recommended terms of reference, and next to that report, we will have all that is being said throughout the town hall meetings, what has been uh, written to us, and all that would be distilled into the, an appendix to our recommendations, our terms. After that, it's up to the government. The government has stated they will hold a national conference. I don't know where it will be. Hopefully, it will be throughout the country. It cannot only be in Port of Spain. It has to be throughout the country. That's, that's my personal view. Um, so like Port of Spain, San Fernando Point, the different population centers, because you want it to be as far and wide. But that's a matter for the government. So our, our function is to gather the views of, of the population formulated into terms, uh, terms, of, terms of reference, present that to the government with the supporting information. That is the contributions that we're hearing here, that we will hear elsewhere, and the written submissions. So the end result of our assignment would be the national consultation. The population will be informed about that by the government. Let me just make one point. The power to change anything really lies with the people. The system, as it stands, you have an opportunity every five years to change. If you find this one isn't working, you change the government. What we're trying to do here is to examine the institutions within the Constitution. That's one of the objectives, to see how we can change that. Is the judiciary working for you? Is the police service working for you? The teaching service commission, all these commissions, are they working? Accountability, I think you are the one who raised accountability. That's very important. So 
you go to the licensing office, and if you don't bribe a fellow there, you're not getting your permit or whatever. That's a, that's a question of accountability. So you have to have, make people accountable. And it's not only making them accountable, they must suffer the consequences of what they're doing wrong. So the power to change anything, whether it's the constitution, whatever it is, lies with the people. So the people must be sufficiently motivated to encourage and insist on the people that govern us to change. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got a microphone across here, please? Yeah. All right. I want to thank you all for making a trip to Point 410. Well, I know James. I used to work for James a long time with transport, right? Um, I, want to, I want to say something here. Um, the trust is broken. I don't know if it could ever come back. Under rather it be the UNC or the PNM. And it's broken real bad. I just weep holding my seven-year-old son that this is the country he have to grow up in. I'd be very, very worried that the politicians making it and uh, the, the people who are suffering at the foot of the politicians not getting any help. Um, recently, I had a woman in a wheelchair, one foot, 12-year-old child. She took a pop on herself. Lost her food card and was real hell, nothing, right? I'm a single father. Um, a certain company I used to work with tell me no employment because I didn't take the vaccine. And so that dead, lost my wife recently. And I don't really have nothing. And I did my best to help this lady, plus to help she get her food card and so on. She would have called counselors, she would have called the local MP office, nothing. Right? I did my best. She got back the card. She's striving now. But you see, the trust is broken. And people has lost so much of hope in all the years of this politics that the, the, the feedback all they're looking for from the people, I don't think all they will really get it. Because we give up. We're tired. We have heard about constitutional this constitutional that we have begged, we have begged, we have cried, we have crawled, we have creeped, we have lost a lot and nothing. So no disrespect again, we talk about trust, right? And we need to trust the MP, we need to trust the, UN, the PNM, we used to trust, to trust the UNC, we need to trust whoever get back in power to make the right decision. But at the end of the day, the history shows they had a majority plus. And nobody tried. Nobody really showed the care. And yes, the country under a lot of unrest, where we even have persons who are thinking about, yeah, let me burn down the parliament, let me start killing politicians, and so on. A lot of persons who, in, in the security apparatuses that sometimes cause my phone, and I have to counsel them, give democracy a chance. The place in a real bad, bad spot. Real bad. It, in, when I say we're in one of the worst positions we've ever been in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. So I don't know how they're going to get what they really need to bring forth, what they're really trying to do here when it comes to constitutional, um, well, let's say reform, right? Because we, we pass that bridge. I know you talk about we shouldn't reach a certain position and we should try to hold on to faith. I have no faith in the system. I don't care whether it be UNC or PNM. I don't have no faith in all politicians. My belief is all politicians needs to go. And all politicians don't want to give young people a chance. And that is one of the biggest problems. So whether it be the MP at point 410, the MP at Labry or whoever, young person comes into these parties pressing to get the things we're trying to get done here, it will never happen because at the end of the day, we have dinosaurs in position who believe that they're always right and that young people are stupid, right? So 
I want to wish all of the best, right? And I hope things work out the way you all are, you know, pushing to get it done. And I want to say good night because as I said, I'm a single father. I need to get to my son. And uh, again, I wish all the best on everybody here. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Microphone here. Present, present email again. Um, I think what, what, what we hear in here tonight underscores. Let me, let me, I think what we hear in here tonight underscores the, the, the value of what is taking place here tonight. I, I, I started off as a counselor here in 2010. Which was about 14 years ago. I was 23 years old. So when the gentleman talk about old people in politics, maybe I spent a while in politics, but I'm still not old. I was 23 years old when I started politics. And I was the counselor for Hollywood, same district I used to live in. Um, I became the deputy mayor. I became the mayor. And today I'm the member of parliament. So that, that also goes to the testament that if you work, you will be rewarded. A lot of things in our society does not work. And it does not work because our laws are outdated. It's very dated. And gentleman made a, made a reference to, to food cards and he made a reference to other things. A lot of people would make references to things here tonight. And I'm not at liberty to say whether they're wrong or they're right. But it also goes to the fact that as a nation, we have things to change. People require service. You go to a government office, and two people are having a chat in front of you, and nobody in care about what you come for, and you spend two, three hours right there to get something done that should really take you 15 minutes. And you leave that entire building thinking that, you see, you see the p and They're wicked, uh, Dr. Rowley, and they're wicked. Right? Or, at that point in time, if it was the People's Partnership in Power, they're wicked, and them don't know what they're doing. So we have to realize that regardless of who is in power, if we don't change the system that we function under, we would never get to the point where service or services or whatever you want to say that is required by the population will reach the point where we as a people are happy. We're talking about trust. Trust is something that you must have. All right? Either pilot. I fly for Caribbean Airlines. When you pay your money and you sit down in the back, you don't know if I was drinking the night before, you don't know if I didn't sleep, you don't know anything, but you sit down in the back, you're comfortable. You'll get something to eat, and you sit down there and you, and you relax. Because you put your faith in somebody that you don't know. That that person is going to take you from point A to point B. You don't know me, you never saw me, you don't know if I, if I, if I did anything wrong the night before. But, you got to trust me. Put my, put my role now as a, as a member of parliament. It's not an easy job. Probably the, probably, it, it, probably the, the single most hard thing that I, that I did in my entire life. But I have never come to, 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 to a political position and waste my time, or waste the time of the people that I represent. So, we are faced with a difficult situation. What do we do? For, for years, in this country. You see this politician and doing that, this minister and doing that, this minister and doing that, this one and doing that. And the same people sit in the same, and different people sit, sit in the same position with the same outcome. It could just mean that the system that they're functioning under just does not work. We've had parliament debates, and we're debating something all until one o'clock in the morning. And it comes down to nil. Because you need the support of the opposition. And this is not just me saying that no, but it has happened in the past as well. You need the support of the opposition because sometimes it calls for a three-fifth majority, sometimes it calls for a special majority. And nobody in budging. And then a political party, because we say politics because everything in this country has some type of political ramifications there. And then the politician will come and say, well, hey, the, 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 the government in power couldn't do this, and they couldn't protect you. The gentleman spoke about guns. 
somebody spoke about customs and, and guns coming in and the port and stuff like that. These are serious issues. These are serious issues. And if we don't change this constitution and if we don't, if we don't really have the reform that we need, and if we don't really reach the place that we reach as where we need to reach as a as a nation, then dog it we suffer. And it's, it's, it has nothing to do with your political affiliation, whether I be MSG, whether I be PNM, whether I be UNC, my brother, he has your own political party. So he has your own objective here tonight. Right? But the challenge becomes for us as a people to understand where we're headed, where we came from. Because if we don't understand where we came from, we find ourselves right back there. And if we don't understand where we need to go, then we wouldn't be able to chart our course to where we go. And I'll say this one thing before I sit. A couple of weeks ago, you know, Boeing had a problem with Max. We fly Max and Trinidad, right? The Max 9 was going somewhere, Colorado, or somewhere, and the door blew off, and somebody went out the door with it or something like that. I, think they, I didn't think they fully um, exited the aircraft, and they were injured. Within 24 hours, a rule came out as to one, that plane is not to fly in the U.S. airspace. That plane is not to fly in anybody's airspace. So as soon as the U.S. ban it, everybody ban it. And two, they set aside something called an airworthiness directive, which means that these measures must be put in place because of that incident, so that incident does not happen again. So we're talking about from, from, from the 1960s and the 1970s when it had the sugar coating amendment for, to now, which is upwards of 40 years plus, 50 years Plus, and we have not made changes. We are delivered rules that are older than me. And I, who sit in the system, the gentleman say, I can't get a food card for nobody. Because everybody's saying tonight that all politicians are corrupt. My son, I get up in the morning and go and make my dollar. You laugh, Mr. Mr. Nisam, you laugh. I said, I get up in the morning and go and make my dollar. So if I don't go and start the plane for Caribbean Airlines and take it to Miami or take it to New York or take it to wherever you have to go, I ain't getting paid. So we, it's, it's, it's really nice for everybody to come and say that all politicians are corrupt. All politicians are corrupt. You wear red jersey, you're corrupt. You wear yellow jersey, you're corrupt. In point, they wear the blue one, they say you're corrupt too. But that's not the reality that we live in. That's something that, that's a perception, and your perception becomes reality. And the reality that we actually live in is that we're in trouble. And we're in trouble because some people see crime as our alternative. Crime could never be our alternative because you're hungry. We had to help, we had to assist the, those who could assist to help feed the nation, to help feed their brothers. Should, should do so. But crime could never be our alternative because of poverty. Somebody talk about education. This is one country that we shouldn't be talking about, but people have opportunity to, to be educated. I went to a flight plane. I was in UV doing physics. I had partners who do three degrees, free. Still went and do medicine. Government paid for that too. So that opportunity, you have a whole ministry of youth development and national service for young people who, who, who fall by the wayside, 18 to 35, to find themselves to do something. And we have opportunity. But we tend to be focusing a lot on the negatives. Yes, we have to focus on the negatives because that is going to inform us as how to how we create rules to, to govern the society. Because that's what we're trying to do. Change the rules so that we can govern the society in, a, in, a, in, in this day and age where things have changed. So I don't want to I don't want to go too much, go too long, but I want to say thanks to the to the to the um, to the head table for, for coming to point and, and allowing everybody to to give their views because I don't think anybody here tonight would have said something wrong because all of that has to be taken into consideration when you're making a rule because all of us don't think alike. Because if all of us would think alike, then we have no need to be here in a, in a, in a reform process. But um, I want to tell you, thank you for, for taking the time to, to come to a point to listen. And I hope that the follow-up, that we come back and, and have that, 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 that discussion before the whole, the national um, consultation. And I hope that everybody here tonight could find themselves to the national consultation as well.
Because if you're interested, somebody said that we have to, 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 to push it down the mines and stuff like that. If you're interested as well, you had to be here to find out what's going on. One thing we have to be is curious, and one thing we have to be is for our country. Country must come first over everything else. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll get the last um, comment. Take the last speaker tonight before we close off. Pleasant good night. All protocols observed. My name is Theophilus Joseph. And um, I want to start off by quoting a part of the preamble of our Constitution. That the wealth of this country must subserve the people of this country. And I want to ask the question to my brothers and sisters here. Is the wealth of Trinidad and Tobago, the sand, the sea, the sun, the oil, the gas, the largest pitch lake in the world serving the interests of the people of this country? Don't answer. I will answer. It's not. Why? No. We have to understand that constitutional law is higher than legislative law. Eh? Am I correct, comrades? So, when the government removes subsidies in the parliament, they are breaking the constitution of Toronto Tobago. Because the wealth of the land is being distributed to the citizenry via subsidies. That is why today the price at the pump is so high. And they boast that they raise it six times and no one has rioted as yet. Our constitution was fashioned from the English Westminster colonial system to control the colonials or the inhabitants of the colonies of England who were looking for their independence and republican state. And it continues to do that. It continues to act as a form of reinvention of a slave system to control the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Because there is a lot of contradiction and hypocrisies within the system. And I'll use one example. I'll be very short. Public servants was offered 4% over six years. Six years. 4% over six years. Think about it. A negotiation period is three years. That's 4% over two periods. If you do the maths, 25% of 4%, because 25% is taxed. So you really get 3%. Who is the chief public servant of Trinidad Tobago? Not the prime minister. Not ministers of parliament are public servants. But guess what? They were offered between them a 22 to 30% increase. And that proposal was sent back only because judges didn't get anything in that recommendation. So I'm asking you, my learned brothers at the head table, to make this thing real. 
and not a talk shop. We want change. We, the people, want change. And I want to talk to my brothers and sisters here that we need to have a revolution of our minds and understand that those in power in parliament don't have the power, you know. The 41 in parliament don't have the power. We have the power. But we need to think. We need to think, brothers and sisters. We need to have a revolution of the mind and hold these people accountable. But we need to have the, the correct tool. And the tool is a working, a working constitution fashioned from the custom and the interests and the needs of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So, the MSJ has a lot to contribute to this process. My leader, David Abdullah, is here right now because he had an emergency. But we would be submitting, if we haven't done it as yet, our written proposal. And I know my leader will also be in one of the other consultations to put forward the MSJ's amendments and recommendations for Trinidad and Tobago working constitution. Thank you very much, and may God bless Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've been at it now for almost three hours, and I think that um, uh, on our schedule, uh, time is drawing nigh. So let me invite uh, the chairman, Mr. Barry Sinanan, to uh, say a few words at this point as we close. Thank you, Dr. Ghani. Um, this meeting was very interesting. We have had plenty of views, plenty of comments. Sitting here, the last two words or three words I've written on my notepad here is the population seems angry. I get a sense of feeling that the population is angry and perhaps for valid reasons. And the reason, the main reason is, as the last gentleman said, things are not working the, the way they ought to work. But what we, the exercise we are on about is to try to make things work. We are charged with the responsibility of getting the information, getting the suggestions and the recommendations from the population. How do you, what do you recommend to make things work? So this is, has been our second meeting. It has been very vibrant and instructive. I just want to say one thing, the, the, the gentleman, the young man there, you can sense the anger. And it's, he's not singular, that there's anger in the country. Lots of things are not working, but one of our tasks is to make sure that we listen to you, get your recommendations, to see how we can make things work for you. The power is in your hands, you know, the people have the power. I want to thank His Worship the Mayor and the councillors and all the Burgesses of Point Forte and the environments for listening, for being here first, and you can rest assured that we will take your contributions seriously when we submit our report to the government. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, for hosting this meeting at your town hall here. Um, thank you, councillors. Thank you all for coming out and contributing. There was one suggestion from this gentleman here that I, I, I found extremely interesting. The idea of having your 39 members of parliament be the chairman of the constituencies. It's an idea I think I'd like to develop. So if you would want to develop that, you have our 
website. You can write to us because I find it's interesting and it needs to be developed. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, and thank you everybody for coming out and participating in this, our second town hall meeting. Do have a good night and a safe trip home. Okay, good, good night, everyone. Chairman, welcome to the meeting. Could we stand for the national anthem, please? Almighty God, giver of all good things, look with favor upon all of us gathered here this evening. Shower us with your blessings of peace, love, and fellowship as we engage in this consultation with the people of Rio Claro and environs for the betterment of the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through constitutional reform. And at the end of these proceedings, take each of us safely back to our homes and our families. Amen. Please be seated. Constitutional reform is a topic that has been around for quite some time. The last attempt at meaningful con uh, constitutional reform in the form of the implementation of a committee's recommendation was in 1976 when the then government implement, implemented some of the recommendations of the Wooden Commission. Since then, things have changed quite a lot in Trinidad and Tobago. We've had uh, social media coming into prominence. All sorts of things have happened since then. The world has progressed rapidly. Countries have progressed more than us to some extent, we need to catch up. Everything that is in the Constitution touches your, our lives in one form or fashion. It is in this regard we are attempting to hear, not we are attempting, we invite you to share your thoughts, your opinions with us as to what you see wrong with the Constitution and how would you like it to be changed? What are your suggestion, suggestions for change? Um, it, is, it is that which we, we want to hear from you. We've had very good, excellent responses to our, uh, our website. People are sending in written submissions. We've had a questionnaire out now recently, and we've been having very good responses. But we want to hear from, from the public orally, and these town halls, we're having 14 in Trinidad, two in Tobago, is to reach the grassroots, as it were, and to hear their views, what it is they would like to see in the Constitution, what is wrong, what, how, how, 
what changes they require. So without going into any further detail, I will ask Dr. Farrell, and he may be joined with Mr. Rodder, I think, to give us an overview on the exercise we are about. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, so one of the things that we've been saying uh, in these meetings is that uh, this, is, this is the fifth time that Trinidad and Tobago has engaged in a constitutional reform exercise since the 1976 constitution. That is the constitution that we now have. So that constitution is almost 50 years old. And since that constitution was put in place in 1976, after the Wooding Commission, uh, we have had the Hayatali Commission, which was in 1988 under the NAR administration. We also had uh, some significant changes to certain laws which impact the Constitution, the Freedom of Information Act, the Judicial Review Act, the Integrity in Public Life Act, under the Pandey administration. Uh, we've had some initiatives by, an initiative by business people, interestingly, uh, the Principles of Fairness Committee in 2006, and they proposed a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, that was around the time, that was during the Manning administration, the second Manning administration. Uh, and then following that, uh, Manning, Prime Minister Manning himself initiated another draft of the Constitution, which was drafted by Ellis Clark. That's what we call that, the, the Ellis Clark draft in 2009. And then under the UNC administration, we had the Ramada Committee in 2013, which uh, engaged in an exercise very similar to this uh, and came up with some proposed amendments to the Constitution in 2015. So this is the fifth time that Trinidad and Tobago has been engaged in this exercise. And I, 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 my, my, my point <laughs> that I make to people is that your, your, your skepticism about these exercises is perfectly understandable. But I think that the fact that we've had these initiatives, plus we've had some initiatives by private individuals, by private organizations, uh, there's the Constitution Reform Forum, the CRF, which over the course of many, many years, in the early 2000s, promoted the whole question of constitution reform. And it says to us that there is a need for constitutional reform. That the reason why these initiatives have taken place, it is because there is a need. The constitution that we have now is not working all that well. Because what the constitution does is that it sets up certain institutions in your society, key institutions. Of course, the parliament, it sets up the, 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 the executive, the, the prime minister, and the cabinet. It sets up the judiciary. It sets up a number of independent institutions, such as the ombudsman, the service commissions, and so on. But if you look at what has happened in Trinidad and Tobago over the course of the last 50 years, it's very clear that many of our institutions are simply not working well. They're not working as they are intended. And while we may think that the problems have to do with the people who are running these institutions, it is more likely the case that the problem is with the institutions themselves. The institutions which were designed, which were really colonial institutions, because one of the things that is important to point out is that the 1976 Constitution did not make any real significant changes compared to the 1962 Independence Constitution. What we did is that we removed the Governor General and we instituted a President of the Republic. And we made some other changes. We took away some powers from the Prime Minister and we gave some of those powers to the President. But basically, the, the Constitution that we are operating with in Trinidad and Tobago today is a constitution that the British basically hurried up and gave to us in 1962. The institutions which we have, like the service commissions, like the way the judiciary functions, like the way the prime minister and the cabinet functions, all those things are really 
colonial institutions. And they're not working well for us. And we see some of the issues and some of the we are, that we are having in the country. And therefore, it seems to me that the fact that we have had all of these attempts, including this one, to attempt constitutional reform suggests that there is a real need for change. And that if we, if we don't get it right on this occasion, if we don't make it happen on this occasion, and it is, it is for the people of Iran to be able to make it happen, if we don't get it right on this happen, then quite frankly, we will have nobody to blame but ourselves when things don't go as they should. And we've had events in the history of this country since independence which have not been particularly good. We have had the Black Power Revolution, we've had the 1970 regime in Unitini, we've had uh, the 1990 attempted coup, which was a very significant event in this country. And, and, and many of these things, the social unrest that we've had and so on, the escalating crime levels that we are seeing across the country are indicative of a set of institutions, a set of structures that are just not working well. And they need change. And the change has to come from the people of Trinidad and Tobago saying to our representatives in Parliament, saying to our politicians, it is time to change. And so this exercise that we are engaged on as a committee instituted by this government uh, is that we, have, we are taking all of the work that was done by the previous commissions and committees starting with Wooding, because as the chairman pointed out, many of the recommendations that were made by the Wooding Commission were not implemented by the Eric Williams government in 1976. He simply set them aside, including recommendations for proportional representation and so on. And so we're taking that, we're taking the Higher Tally Commission report, we're taking the Principles of Fairness draft constitution, we're taking the Ellis Cloud draft, we're taking the Ramada Committee uh, recommendations. And then we have gone out to the population of Trinidad and Tobago, and we're using modern technology. We are, so people are responding to us via email. To date, we have received over 280 email submissions coming into us. We are engaging with a number of experts, people who are constitutional lawyers, uh, people who are um, senior public servants, retired, and so on to come and talk to us about some of the kinds of changes. And then we are engaged in this process of the town hall meetings where we come to you in your communities and we want to hear from you what are some of the things that concern you, some of the kinds of recommendations that you would like to see. So our job is really quite simple. It is, it is, it is really to listen. Um, this is as much talking as you're going to get from us. Uh, during, during this evening, it is to hear from you this evening. For us, it doesn't matter whether we have two people, or 20 people, or 200 people. We are here to, to get your voice, to capture your voice, to capture your thoughts, to capture your, your recommendations, and to make ourselves available to you for that purpose. So with that, I will just turn it over to our moderator, um, Professor Hamid Ghani. Um, I just want to point out that Professor Ghani, um, I don't know what he did in his lives, but he has been involved in every single one of these reform initiatives, except Wooding, he was perhaps too young at the time, but he was involved with the Hayat Ali Commission, the Principles of Fairness Commission, the Ellis Club Draft, and the, and, the, and the Ramada Committee Draft, and he's involved with us in this exercise as the moderator for some of these proceedings. So I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Professor Ghani, who will uh, invite you to make your contributions. Thank you very much, Dr. Farrell, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, <clears throat> my pleasure to be uh, here with you this evening. Uh, I want to welcome uh, everyone here this evening to the public consultations of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. My name is Hamid Ghani and I shall be moderating some of these public consultations being hosted by the NACCR. Uh, before we begin, I would like to offer some guidelines for how we shall proceed. Uh, individuals who are coming forward to offer their recommendations for constitutional reform 
will have up to five minutes to present their proposals. Participants are asked to be respectful of all views expressed here and all persons in attendance here. Uh, if there is available time, anyone who spoke earlier this evening may come back if they would like to express a supplemental proposal for constitutional reform. The session is being recorded to facilitate the Secretariat to compile all of the proposals advanced here tonight. I would ask that you give your name and your general area of residence so that your points of view can be properly assigned to you. Uh, I look forward to having a successful engagement this evening. And before I invite persons to catch my eye to come forward uh, to make your proposal, I'd just like to introduce members of the head table, starting on my extreme left. Mr. Nizam Mohammed, a former Speaker of the House of Representatives and a former parliamentarian. Next to him, uh, Ms. Jackie Sampson Miguel, a former clerk of the House of Representatives of Trinidad and Tobago. Next to her, Mr. Ray Sandy, uh, who is uh, from Tobago and is also involved with the Regulated Industries Commission. And on my left is Mr. Winston Rudder, Chair of the Public Service Commission. On my right is Dr. Terence Farrell, uh, who has been involved in a number of activities, Economic Advisory Board, and a number of other national initiatives. And to my extreme right is Mr. Barendra Sinanan, a former Speaker of the House of Representatives, who is the Chair of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite uh, persons to uh, come forward and express their point of view. There is a microphone in the middle of the center aisle here. So please fe feel free to uh, come forward if you wish to express a view, and uh, we'd be very happy to hear from you. So the floor is now open. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Members of the board at the head table and everybody else present. My name is Winston Gypsy Peters. And I am indeed from Miaro, Rio Claro, Guaygue area, and Moruga. I could even say I'm from Shogonas because I live there as well. Long and short of it is I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. But my interest here is simple. And I don't need really five minutes to say it. Because I've been saying this for a long, long time. First of all, I am wishing this committee well. And I hope that this time around, all that we have put together would work and redound to the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago because really we are commission weary in this country in terms of having all these commissions and whether it be electoral or whatever it is. We get nothing out of none of them. So I wish you luck as well as I'm wishing us luck. But what I would really like to see, I would like to see just about three things really. I would like to see a statutory date for elections in Trinidad and Tobago. Meaning that we know it's five years, so on the, on the 10th or the 1st of whatever, of December, January, February, March, of the end of that five years, we must have elections. And when I say election, I mean whether it is general or whether it is House of Assembly elections or whether it is in fact the local elections, because we are tired. This local election, I remember one time, it didn't have none for about nine or ten years. And next time somebody come up and say they just, we have in local election and they just have it. Willy nilly, and the people at Trinidad and Tobago just have to go along with it. So I do not believe that that is the way that we should go forward. I believe that we should have some dates when we're going to have election. I know when, I know when it's election in America for the next 20 years. I could tell you exactly when it's election. 
20 years from now, I could tell you exactly what day is going to be and when it's going to be. In Trinidad and Tobago, when election is due, then we have a next 30 days or, a next, or some prime minister could just say, no, well, we don't want to have it now, so 30 days from the, from the due date we can have it. I would like to see us do something about that. And I hope that this commission could take these statutory dates forward so indeed we can do something that would make us more look like a first world country than continue to look third world all the time with these set of willy-nilly things that we do in the country. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Peters. Pleasant evening to Mr. Sinanan and the members of the head table, um, local government representative from my or not, Mr. Rand Stewart, Mr. Peters, and every other one here this evening. Pleasant evening. So, my name is Raymond Cozier, and I'm the chairman of the Mayoru Rio Clara Regional Corporation. And I'm here this evening because I, I, I see this exercise as an extremely important exercise. And um, reading the flyer, the first paragraph that says, the Constitution is the law that states how Trinidad and Tobago is to be governed. Uh, it identified the branches of government and the limits of their powers. It also safeguards our individual rights and freedom and protects our democracy. That is, to me, a very powerful and, and the, most, the most important uh, 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 aspect of, of, of the rule of our nation, and, and it, it requires uh, the concern of every citizen. So, um, it turned out here, uh, it's not what we would like it to be, but, um, but we have, you have the, the, the chairman exercise, um, expressed that we, they are getting a lot of uh, feedback from via the inter um, internet and um, emails and other, 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 uh, other forms of information. So which is, it's, it shows that people are still responding, even though they're not showing up in the house, people are responding, and which is great. But expressing the importance of this exercise, um, and understanding the fact that there has been so many different ones. To me, the exercise is not one that should be rushed. I don't know the mandate of the, of the committee. I don't know what's the time span for wrapping up of the exercise and the presentation of the, of the document of all the facts that they would put together. I don't know how long that they would take with that and how long this exercise would take. But to me, uh, based on the experience of all the different uh, commissions that an exercise that, 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 that has been engaged in before, and today, the constitu Constitution is still is not working, says something is wrong about the whole exercise. What that is, is that the committee, that is an exercise that the committee should be engaging in, in analyzing what has not been done correctly, what uh, are, 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 the, are, the, are the, the facts or the, are, are the pieces that is missing in, in getting this thing right. And because we don't want it to be an ex exercise that five years from now or ten years from now, we come in to say the same thing again. So, 
the exercise should not be rushed. And, um, and we, we should be engaging in exercises that we are, are, are really mobilizing and encouraging people to be part of the exercise. Also, a lot of people in this country don't know the Constitution. A lot of people, uh, a lot of citizens in this country don't know the Constitution. They might know one or two things about the Constitution. So, so there should also be an exercise in engaging different groups, different bodies in the, in the country in sharing information on what the Constitution has and engage exercises that will um, get them to understand what the Constitution is, will know what the Constitution is, and then give feedback on what, uh, what they think it should be. So those are not exercises that could be rushed. Uh, so um, I had that same point that Mr. Peter shared on fixed dates for election, general, local, House of Assembly, I had that same, that same point. So, great minds think alike. Um, so that's one of the concerns, uh, one of my, my concerns. Also, um, my, some other concerns that, uh, uh, that I have is, um, uh, uh, President and Prime Minister, do we need both in Trinidad and Tobago? All right. Um, so we had change. It was governor, and we changed from governor to president. Um, basically, it was just, to me, cosmetic. Just change a name. No real meaningful change was made. Um, so do we need, do we really need a president and a prime minister? Or do we need a president alone or a prime minister alone? This is, that is a concern that, that I have. Um, uh, the justice system in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is hindering the justice system in Trinidad and Tobago? Is the justice system in Trinidad and Tobago contributing to the whole crime escalation in the country? Uh, people are languishing in jail, waiting on, 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 on proper uh, uh, opportunity for the case to be held. All these are situations that, uh, that is affecting our citizens. We have uh, in, uh, in our parliament um, at present we have uh, an opposition with 19 seats 19 MPs, government 21. But the same opposition have six senators. While the government have nine independent senators. Is that the correct thing to be happening? And we have a situation where uh, we, you, you wonder if the independent senators is really independent. The process to choose independent senators should that come, the process of how that should come, that should be looked into. Because people, you know, it's something must not only, uh, must not only uh, uh, you see, it must not only appear, it, it, it must not only be real, but it must also appear to be real. So, that is another situation that I think uh, should be addressed. We, local government reform. We're talking local government reform. That is part of the Constitution. Uh, a lot of talk, a lot of talk about local government reform. And so far, all that was put in place is the change of the, of the election date, election uh, term from three years to four years. So many other aspects. Uh, um, the financial and financial authority of the, of the local government bodies, uh, we, it's still for the Minister of Finance and, and local government bodies, monies are still released to local government bodies under special heading. Um, 
amount of heads that is needed. Some of the heads, local government bodies, uh, don't have the heads that they really want to do, heads that really fit in, 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 in the desires of the region. And all these matters, those are some of the matters that are of concern. I do want to stay too long, but, um, you know, as I say, there should be subcommittees, there should be subbodies, uh, there should be, um, from, from this head, there should be subgroups going out there, meeting with small groups, meeting with clubs, meeting with British councils, meeting with different bodies, and engaging in an exercise of, 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 uh, uh, of allowing them to understand what and know what is in the, con the Constitution and engage in rapport that could co a proper document could come. And then also now, I, um, Mr. the last one I want to say, Mr. the President, the Chairman spoke about, um, no, not Chairman, Mr. Far Dr. Farrell, spoke about a number of things that was put together in all the different commissions are still on a shelf somewhere, has not been implemented. How comfortable one could feel that all more submissions making to this body, where is it going, right? Um, and, and who is going to determine what is going to make it off the shelf? Those are some serious concerns that I wanted to share. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you, Mr. Kozik. Could I just clarify something? You could just go back. I need to clarify. <clears throat> you, is it that you are suggesting that local government should be made a part of the Constitution, to be included in the Constitution? Yes. Okay. And you mentioned about the government has nine independent senators. Is it that the government has 16 senators of its own? There are nine independent senators separate and apart from the government. Yes. So you, you want to have the process for selecting independent senators reviewed? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Rudder would like to raise uh, a couple issues. Thank you, thank you, moderator. Um, just by way of explaining myself, I cut my teeth as a public servant in Rio Claro 59 years ago on the Rio Claro demonstration station. And it seems to me that my going away uh, swan song is going to be in Rio Claro again in this constitution reform exercise. But I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, Mr. Kozier raised, uh, you raised a, a couple of questions that I think are very, all, all very interesting, but if you would uh, clarify. Uh, the issue of uh, ignorance about the Constitution is real and probably manifests itself in the fact that so not many people are out discussing the matter robustly. And therefore, you are suggesting, that I, I, if I understand correctly, that coming out of this exercise should be, or part of what we are doing, should be initiating some purposeful uh, education process related to the Constitution. Um, maybe you have some ideas of how this can be done and perhaps you might want to share it with us later. The question I, I, I would ask though is having regard to the fact that there are so many concerns about the Constitution that we currently are aware of and know, would you be uh, amenable to going ahead with changes on the basis of which we have certain knowledge and understanding now, while we await and at a later point in time deal with other changes that might arise as coming out of a, a fuller education system? Just as a suggestion, yes. 
So in Trinidad and Tobago, right? Um, um, uh, I want to get the correct phrase. Uh, uh, temporary, this, this we end up permanent, right? <laughs> so you might do a job and you say, okay, we're just doing a, a, a temporary thing for, for expediency. Most of the time, that expediency, temporary job, stay permanent, right? So, if I could say this, I'm not sure if I'll be saying the right thing, but um, we had many before that we did. And um, maybe the same process or the same, the same thought process will engage when we say, well, let's do some by the time, and then as we go, we we'll keep fixing. Um, I'm not sure that the constitution should be, we should be every five years or think going into the constitution. I, I, I'm not sure, but um, not that I am against doing something, but I, 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 am, I, I am feeling that um, whatever we're doing, the importance of this must be done good. Because we have experience in the past that we have done probably five or six or how much, how many different ones already. And um, so many things still isn't working. Have we, um, or are we doing the same thing that we did over the past times that we, that we did it? Are we doing the same thing? Are we using the same processes? Or are we doing something different? You know what we said about being mad, right? Doing the same thing over and over. Right? So, if we are doing the same thing that we have done all the time over the years, then it, is, it isn't making sense. Um, and also, what I'm saying is that I am, I, I am not, to me, right, to me, I am not seeing enough emphasis is being, is being exercised to activate, to excite, and generate a deeper sense of interest and concern in the citizenry to, to get their voices heard in this whole exercise. Okay, I have um, some comments from Ms. Jackie Sampson Miguel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Proceedings. Mr. Cozier, good evening. Yeah, Thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm particularly interested in your comments regarding local government. As you know, as all of us know, currently the Constitution designates three branches of state, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Local government is part of the executive branch. Are you suggesting a different model? Am I suggesting? A different model. Should local government remain as it is a part of the executive branch? First question. I'm not sure I understand your question, but um, what, I'm, what I'm saying, right? We, we, we have moved, uh, we, we, are, we are moving local government from where it was, right? And we, right now we're in the process of, the, of reform. Correct. Um, and, uh, some of the things that are, are there are, are ventilating the chain initiatives in as it relates to local government reform. I, I, I always felt that some of those things could have been established without reform. Right? Okay. Um, the, the reform didn't have to come for some of the things that you're saying now to be implemented. Right? Um, and some of the things that are there has not has not been uh, uh, addressed. And um, no, this is not bashing, eh? we're not bashing no government or anything. We just, we're dealing with real issues here, how we could fix the thing, right? And I am saying that we are embarking on a reform, which is, 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 is um, the plan is to give more autonomy to the local government body, yeah. which every, I believe every local government representative will be happy about, yeah. especially uh, chairmen and mayors, 
right? Because you, you are bogged in and locked in with, uh, with administration who still dictating, dictating the pace and uh, who still, in some cases, are serious hindrance to progress and, uh, uh, of, of, of things happening in your region. So, on that same note, I am saying that um, we, they, they have to do to go a little deeper into, in, into the whole process and still ensure that the body is able to function with authority because you, you are still finding yourself from what, from what is happening. We are still finding ourselves in this uh, 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 obstructionist situation where yeah. the local government authority is still not able to function with authority. So presently, you report to the Ministry of Local Government. Yeah. Uh, is that a satisfactory arrangement in your view? Well, if, we, if, this, if, this, if this local government authority is, is their own authority, we really don't need a Ministry of Local Government. Okay. okay. What you need is finance. Right? And, 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 and the, the, the ability to employ the competent people to ensure that the authority functions properly and effectively. May I have one, one last question? And how would you recommend local government report to the people? Um, because currently local government reports to the people through the Minister of Local Government in the Parliament. Yeah? Local government reports. Reports to the people. Yes. Uh -huh. Through the Ministry of Local Government. So all reporting to the people on what is done in local government is done through the Minister of Local Government to the Parliament. So all questions about local government matters um, will go through that minister and responses will be given in Parliament. How do you propose that problem should be solved? Should you, do you believe that local government members should be represented in parliament somehow? How is it going to be um, resolved if local government is considered autonomous, independent of the government? Well, they will never be independent from the government okay. because the government is responsible for every organization and every institution. They will always okay. be under the government. Is one. Two, um, I don't believe that uh, all local government authority will be, ever be able to function on its own free from, uh, uh, free from government uh, disbursement and financial resources. Okay. Um, and Mayaro, the, re the region of Mayaro, if they allow us to um, have all the monies that come from Mayaro, well, we really wouldn't need any disbursement from the government because we have all these. Uh, uh, multinational and national companies operate in our region. Not all the regions are fortunate like us. So that you will, you will always have to be under the, 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 the government of the day. Right? Okay. So that's one. Two, uh, how to report mm -hmm. to the nation. Uh, I'm not sure how that could go, so I didn't want to just say something. Right? I, didn't, I didn't have a thought on that. So but, um, but in the whole, in the, in the whole uh, act or the whole uh, formation of the local government authority, there, there must be um, the all authority uh, is accountable to the nation, is accountable to the government. So some system of accountability and reporting must be installed. Thank you very much. Just on that point, Mr. Kozia, um, is it that you are envisaging that with the enhancement of the status of local government, with local government reform, you want an elevation to a constitutional status. Uh, I recognize the issues of reporting and accountability and so on, but is it that you are envisaging that now that the local government status is intended to be elevated, you want that elevation to constitutional status Yes. Uh, much like how the Tobago House of Assembly is included in the Constitution as part of the Constitution, right. 
you want to find some mechanism whereby the local government bodies in Trinidad will get some kind of elevation as well. Is that, is that where you're going with Quite your thinking? So. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So they just bring the microphone and, uh, yeah, just take the microphone alone. Mr. Mohammed would like to um, yes, thank, th thank you very much. make a contribution. Um, one of the points that Mr. Cozier has made is that um, citizens do not know the Constitution. And um, you have any idea why, why that is so? How do you, um, why, do you, why do you say something like that? Okay, so why, why I would say that, right? Um, people, yes, over the, over the years, there is no, the, 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 constitu the Constitution is not thought in school. Just raise your voice a little bit. The Constitution is not thought in school in no real way. It might, one or two things might be shared, but to say as a, as a form of, of edifying the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, the Constitution is not thought, is not ta taught in primary school or secondary school, right? So you come from school, you will only be uh, interested or, or uh, engage in something of, of the Constitution that, um, that interests you. you know, most of the citizens, I don't believe, spend any time going through all of the Constitution and all what is their rights and what is not their rights. Right? And in this time now, the Constitution, as far as the, the normal layman is concerned, the Constitution not adding no food on his table. The Constitution and putting a uh, 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 thing and helping them to eat. Uh, people, more, right now people are studying how to live. They want job, they want food, they have to mind their family, they're sent to the school. People are not embarking on those situations. So studying the Constitution is of no priority to the normal man and woman in this country. That's how I see it. 60, 64 years ago, as a school teacher in Rio Claro, all the primary schools, we had one, one secondary school here that was called the Modsec School, as Gypsy would remember. Every single primary school had a subject called civics. And I am telling you, in those years, around 1961-62, you had the children in these schools who knew every single prime minister in the Commonwealth. In the Commonwealth. Yeah, you talk about 64 years ago. And right. when I was in primary school in Tableland, we had it on on the permanent blackboard, as we called it then, who were the nominated members to the Legislative Council in Trinidad. So we have had, we have had a suggestion at another, we have had a, a suggestion at another similar meeting, in point 14 to be exact, someone suggesting that we should make copies of the Constitution available to the man in the street. And um, do you think that, that that alone is sufficient or we should reintroduce civics in all the schools? We should do both. Both. And the next question I want to ask is, I am of the opinion, and I might be totally wrong, it appears as if local government, which is nearest to the man in the street, wherever in Trinidad in particular, not so much Tobago, in Trinidad, seems to be, uh, there seems to be a very wide gap. I don't want to use a big word as emasculated. 
the population seems to be emasculated from the, 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 their representatives, you know, they are representatives. They, 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 they are so distant from their representatives. And my friend here, Jackie, raised the question, how do you see something, if I am correct, how do you see something like that being corrected at the local government level? So I wouldn't say that the, 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 the local government representative is distant from, uh, from the people. Um, every local government representative is, is, uh, are in office because they were elected I, I, by... I'm not hearing you. Sorry. If you lift your voice. Are you I, saying no. you, um, the people are not distant from the local government representatives? Yeah. I, well, yeah. Well, I, say, I don't think that uh, uh, the point you're saying that the people are distant from the local government representative. I'm saying that I don't think that the people are distant from the local government representative. Every local government representative that at, at, in office was elected by 1,000, 2,000, 600, how many, 1,500 people to put them in office, right? But um, getting into office, um, that exercise, this exercise we'll be speaking about here uh, is, is not a priority. Right? And, um, and things like these should become uh, something that, that local, local government bodies engage in. Because we are government, local government. So we are government. So uh, things that the government should be doing, we cannot um, absolve ourselves and we can't uh, say, you know, that is for that government. And we also should be part of it. But then the whole thing about it is that. Uh, the, 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 the exercise is, has not um, been implemented for whatever reason. You know, um, that has not been a priority. But in identifying now, when I try to identify all the shortcomings and all the things that we should apply and all the things that we should adapt, you know, um, this, this may be one of the things that the local government should be get involved with because the local government reps um, are involved with the, with, the, with, the, with the electors and the electorates. Right, well, one, of, one, of the, um, one of our um, understanding or methods, methods of approach in these consultations that we are having is that we, we, we are here to hear from the people, you know, not to, to engage in, in any argument, so to speak. Um, but for, for the benefit of my colleagues on the committee and those who are present, I have been in contact with you and I know that you have tried your best and you have raised this event with your counselors, all the men, whoever and so on, and you have tried your best to, to um, advertise and encourage people to come here. And I know that councillors um, have another commitment. We didn't take that into consideration when we planned this date, this Monday forum that the opposition party normally would have. Uh, I think it's the first Monday in every month. And that really slipped us so that the councillors are not here. Uh, so we can understand that. We can understand that. And it is not a complaint. But I would have thought that as councillors on the ground, and if they are in touch with the people they represent, you know, they could have asked people, and people should have been sufficiently interested to respond to their request that in their absence, people, um, the people in their electoral districts should come out and hear what we are, um, you know, what we are talking about as a government appointed um, uh, so, committee. So, uh, yeah, I, I take your point, but um, well, you know, uh, being real, right? Being real, um, politics has a lot of biases in it, right? A lot of? Biases. Yes. Right? Um, you know, we, and, I, and I'm trying to be real, right? So, of course, of right. course. So, um, you know, they might feel, well, you know, this might be a PNM thing. In UNC time, it says that UNC thing, right? Um, 
And that's a, that's a real situation. Um, uh, to me, I don't see this as UNC or PNM thing. I, the Constitution governs all UNC, PNM, and none of the above. And the, the final decision that will be implemented uh, 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 for Trinidad and Tobago is going to govern all. So it should be uh, a, 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 a conversation or an engagement that all should be interested in. Right? But. Um, I can say, I, I understand what Mr. Koze is saying, but based on who we are seeing here and what we are seeing, neither is here. So the thing about it is that, like I said earlier, people are just wary people, not, not, not UNC people or PNM people or whoever people. People are wary of these things being done without any result. I mean, no implementation whatsoever. How much time in, 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 in our lifetime, I'm 71 years old, so I am old enough to know a lot of things that happen in, in this place. And I have seen this on so many occasions. I mean, I myself am wary. I only come here out of, I mean, because I'm semi-intellectual person who want to know a little more about, you know, about, about what my constitution is all about. And I can't say I'm an expert on the constitution. If I want to do anything, I actually, as, even as a former government minister, I would go like any other exam I'm going to do and go and, you know, revisit it and look at it. How many ordinary persons, let's face it, how many ordinary persons, I don't care what their, their political suasion is, are going to come to, to, to sit down to listen to you talk about your constitution. Like he said a little earlier, a lot of these people are somewhere about the place trying to get something for the children to go to school tomorrow. You know? And like you said, the councillors who who, who, who were elected, um, a, lo a lot of them now, their political shenanigans take them away from this. So they, they, they are not even here to, to, let's say, represent their district, even though the people from the district are not here. But you, th th this is something that we can't, I, I don't think that we can force this on anybody. And I want to say this, that I don't think that in any country in the world, and I've been to a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of them, I've also lived in quite a few of them, and I don't think that there's any country in the world where the common man know anything about the Constitution. And I want to say that, and I want to say it without fear of contradiction. The common man really don't care about, uh, not that he doesn't care, he doesn't really have time to, to immerse himself in, 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 into this kind of thing. He leaves this for the government who he, who he, 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 he elected to do and hope that they do the right thing. Fortunately, the government now like, like, like I guess governments before are doing the right thing, but somebody somewhere down the line, on the assembly line, they don't know how to put the part together. It is not that the parts are not there. I am sure that in all these constitutional things that we have had or, or, or con consultation over the years, like, like you said, we have, we have sufficient of everything to put together, but somebody has to have they, 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 they wear it all. Well, not they wear it all, because they do have the wear it all. Somebody has to have the, the nerve to, somebody has to have the wanting to, to do all of this and make sure that they put it together <coughs> and let the parts work. It's, we, 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 a constitution has a lot of moving parts. A constitution is not a stoic thing. England doesn't have a written constitution. As a matter of fact, we have an extract out of England, unwritten constitution, which they rewrite every single day. And we, st we are stuck with, 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 with whatever they have here and, and we can't find a way out of it. So the, 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 the fact is that we have to look for some kind of a, a, a way that fits us, us. The first thing that we have to do with our constitution is to make sure that it fits us. We, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and we have a constitution now that doesn't fit us. It doesn't fit us at all. So somebody have to take all these parts that we have already and put it together because people are wary. They're wary. I don't think you, if you carry on this, 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 this consultation, for, it's the 15th is going to be up, I think. If, if you carry it on for the next 50 months, you wouldn't get more, more people than this coming there because the people are just constitution, I mean, consultation wary. So let's just get the things that we have together and the little that we have to, we're going to get here. I would lend my little voice into it because I can make a song and tell them what to do, you know. 
and I will do that, I could do that and, 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 and help them along so that they would know exactly how, we, how urgent it is to put this thing together and get it going. How long every time we come, something go wrong, we, we, we have some consultation. Something go wrong, we put our next set of people. And, something, and, and this goes for everything. Trinidad and Tobago love consultation. And we love to put you know, these, 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 these committees together. So let's try to see what, what, how, how we could get the moving parts going, man. I think, I, I, if I may say, I think we are getting into the marrow of the matter with the contributions from both of you. And I think we are actually on the same wavelength. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm repeating myself. What do we do to generate that kind of interest? Because as an ambassador for freedom, you have been a lifetime, you have spent your entire lifetime as an ambassador for freedom. And that is what a constitution is all about, propagating and protecting the people's freedom. And if you were not a freedom fighter, we cannot interpret in your soul what, what energizes you to produce what you have produced over the years. So when you talk about the Constitution must reflect we and where we have come from and what we stand for. This is our mission at, at the head table here. And this is what we, we want to get to the marrow of the matter. And you all are now actually being so open. My question is, how do we handle our people? You have seen it as, you, as a performer, right? And you know that the people possess the energy. The energy is in this population. We have inherited it in spite of all that we know of the past. We have inherited it. How do we harness that energy is something that haunts, haunts a lot of us who understand what we are about in concerning this exercise. I think what all, 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 that, all, all that's missing, the missing part in this is the will to implement. What's missing in all of this that we are doing here is the will to implement. Because somewhere along the line, like I have been in, I mean, I have been involved in the, 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 the full spectrum of, 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 of Trinidad's life, whether it is politics or whether it is entertainment, whether, wh whatever it is, whether it is writing, whatever it is, I am part of it. And the thing about it, I have seen what the problem is. The problem is not the will of the people to want what they want. The problem is the will of the people in charge to implement what the people want. And that is, was, and seemed to be always the problem. If we can take, like I said before, all that we have done, and collate it, just look at what it is, it's there. This is, this, I mean, what I'm, what I'm about to say, I, I, I'm not, I don't mean it in a negative way, but what we're doing here is not really necessary, you know. What we're doing here is really we should have been having a committee like, like yours sitting in some place now taking all the hue wooden things and the, all, the, all the other things that go before and dissect it, look at the things that the people said for 50 years they've been saying the same thing and put it together and make sure that we implement the, the, the things inside it. Because it's a regurgitation. You have generations saying the same thing. I was never wrong in the hue wooden time. But I'm sure that there are people who were in those consultations who are saying exactly what I am saying now. And I am sure that it is documented. I can tell you that it's documented. That much I know. So the fact remains is that this, a committee like yours, should be set up and given all these with all the intellectual people that we have here, given 
all the things, the writings that we have already, and please save the people from trying to, 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 to come up with, 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 with new things. You ever went to confession a long time? Yeah. When you go confession a long time, you're going by the priest this week, you never do nothing, you know, but your mother and them send you to confess, so you go on and start to say, a thief milk, a, a, a play marble, a picture under the thing, you never do none of it. This is what is happening here. It's actually people looking for things to say. And, you know, and, and, but generations have been saying it. Let's implement it. What we are lacking, and I want that to be documented that I say that, what we are lacking is the will of implementation. That is what we are lacking. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's get some, yes, the gentleman here wants to. Hi, good night. Um, you you might just want to stand so we can see you because there's a camera here that... Uh, if you're in the front row, you could sit, but it's difficult to take you sitting behind the other people. Hi, good night. My name is Brian Richards. Brian. Um, well, I came from Saparia side, reason being. Um, I'm taking into consideration that this project has a fast approaching deadline, and I didn't take the opportunity to go to point Fortin, which time-wise is a little closer. You want to just hold the mic a little closer oh. to you? Yeah. Um, so because I'm not sure when next time I get a close opportunity to attend before the 15th, I decided to attend. Um, I wanted to say, I agree, because I came in a little bit late, with everything that I've heard discussed so far tonight. But what I would like to put to the discussion at this time is that there are things that are missing from the conversation as it's been documented, for two reasons. One, as a young person in Trinidad and Tobago, I know there's a very consistent verbalization of a commitment to include young people. But even, and I attend public forums as often as I can, um, even tonight there are not that many persons probably under, let's say, 35 here. And to stretch the idea, 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, those young people are not thinking about what even something like this process, but a council meeting, a police community meeting, can potentially do for them if what they say is implemented, of course. Right? Additionally, I think these kind of activities attract a type of person, and I wouldn't get into it, but because it doesn't attract a lot of other people, a lot of other people won't attend. That doesn't mean that they don't have things to say or to contribute, it just means that for the same reasons as expressed, they have other priorities, they're just not going to take the time. All right? Um, I have been following this advisory committee's activities because constitutional reform is something that I'm interested in. I like to read about it. I like to look at it. Um, organizational, organizational design, those kinds of things as well. So following the committee and coming down to last week, not seeing even the kind of activity in terms of even public forums, um, I wanted to get my peers more involved, so I started using my very small social media network to promote at least the social media pages, to talk about constitutional reform, to get more young people involved. Um, the response is not as exciting, but I say that to make the point. I want to task this committee as, from what I understand, Part of its purpose is to outline the way that we will go into a further process of constitutional reform. Um, because I'm, I'm not sure about it. Persons who I show it to, they ask me about it as well. And so I'm kind of posing that question as well tonight. A lot of people aren't clear, especially because of the kinds of comments that you've seen in the media from persons who aren't on the committee, the prime minister included, etc. It's not really clear what the function, the full function, and the limit or the remit of this committee is 
but at least the way in which it's communicated, some of us are inclined to believe that something is supposed to happen after. You all are supposed to kind of tell us how and what and those kinds of things. So to clarify that. That, this conversation then, at the end of it, you all should be able to tell that committee how to go about engaging the various demographics in the country effectively. So, I'm a young person, I see you all are doing promotions now with more popular persons. I saw the promotion with Blaze, for example, but you have a way to go, right? I mean, and I'm respecting the fact that you all are professionals, you all have other commitments, and you all are doing a service to the country, but more than setting up a plan to teach the Constitution, if you want to reach young people, you have to get them where they are, in school, in extracurricular, co-curricular events, you have to reach out to President's Award, find some way to get them even to get those young persons involved. If it's to, if it's to write, if it's to host sessions. Um, no, and so it's the same thing. I say those things and I have to consider that that may be beyond your remit. But again, those are the kinds of things that we may have to consider necessary to effectively engage in a, public, in a public consultation process on what we think needs to change in the nation. Um, so I'll hand over the mic now. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you for your um, comments, Mr. Richards. Before I take the next person, Chairman, I don't know if you want to just say a word on the remit of the committee, because he asked for clarity. Yes, our remit is simply to gather the views of the population at large. And um, when we get those views, we put it into what is called a terms of reference. We submit it to the government. The government will then call a national consultation. Now, the national consultation, as I've indicated before, cannot only be in Port of Spain. It has to be in the population center, so San Fernando, um, Tobago, east, south. Um, so that basically is it. But we need the views of the people, exactly what we're getting here this evening, your views. Um, Chairman Kozia give us quite a list. Gypsy also, we, we listen to you. So it's to gather the views and put it into terms of reference. Now, having done that, we have people who are contributing through emails and, and through the internet. We've had over 200 and something um, written submissions. We've put out a questionnaire, I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, right, the recommendations of here, the, the, the website. Um, we've had about 432 direct recommendations already through the internet. Um, so that is what we're hoping to, to achieve. We take all that and then put it into terms of reference. So having put the terms of reference, all that everybody's contributing here will also be on the internet, okay? We wouldn't, if three people say they want Gypsy and Mr. Cozy and you say, okay, we want fixed term. But well, we won't put fixed term elections three times. We know that that is a topic that needs to be discussed. So all that would be in a working document, apart from the terms of reference. And it is our view that that working document, once we submit it to the, the government, it's going to be available, hopefully, to the, the public. So the public can read what we have done. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this gentleman here wanted to make a contribution. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasant good afternoon, evening to everyone. My name is Junior Suknanan. I am a retired primary school teacher. I am here due to a concern of the Teaching Service Commission. I believe that the Teaching Service Commission acts as a rubber stamp under Section 90 of the Constitution. 
the fact that the Teaching Service Commission is insulated from grievous decisions taken by being a, I'm not sure if the terminology is correct, a quasi-judicial body, all right, allows the Teaching Service Commission in erring not to allow any member, or oh sorry, any redress by a member of the Teaching Service Commission against whom an injustice is done. And I'm speaking from a personal experience. Uh, it is even more alarming to think that our protective services, public service commissions and commissions are also insulated and their functions of hiring, promoting, transferring, discipline, etc. If it is flawed, no one is held culpable, right? Because of that insulation um, entrenched in uh, that body. I have heard that consultations took place. Well, I was uh, present in the last consultation and made a, a submission on a different matter. But um, as everybody else is, else here is concerned, nothing moves forward. I'm speaking about probably 2013 or so, 10 years plus. And um, I do hope that this consultation bears fruit. Um, and I would like to just refer to the last consulti the last working document on January 9, 2009, which states, that's a working document, states that uh, on the clause 166, that the teaching service Commission functions can be done by an educational human resource agency. That, that was just from, uh, a clause in the last rounds of consultation. Uh, this may be acceptable, yes, of course, uh, looking at the, 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 the functions of the Teaching Service Commission, in my opinion. But further in clause 168 of that same document, the Teaching Service Commission reappears for the purpose of appeals um, should the, the, the Educational Human Resource Agency err in some way or the other. Uh, that's according to my understanding. Um, I am just here to, 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 to express my concern and, and, and uh, hope that a change takes place within the Teaching Service Commission and, on, and by extension all the service commissions. Because with that protection that they have, we are hearing here, as Mr. Farrell said, that uh, it is just not working. It is not working and I think that may go back to, to, to possibly the fact that it has to be changed in parliament. You may need three-fifths or three-quarter majority. And many of the issues here that may be discussed may not reach that. And we have to face reality and know that since the year 2000, with the 1818 deadlock, um, and presently, if we minus the two Tobago seats, we have like a, 18, a 1920 situation. So it is extremely difficult to get that majority, and I believe that that is a hindrance for the Constitution moving forward or for even making recommendations. I don't know what the specialists, the panelists may, may, may suggest or consultations in June may bring forward, but um, it is imperative that we do something about it. Uh, the legal minds who sit there to, to, to guide us along, I do hope that something comes out of this consultation because I have had the experience um, of a disciplinary matter and if it was not the, for the services of an articulate lawyer, um, I would have languished. I have been retired four years now, and I may not have had my situation, my position resolved because I could not do anything except get legal advice. I mean, the, 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 the Teaching Service Commission acted and things like that. Whatever it is, um, I would make submissions or, or by the deadline date on the 15th, and for other matters too. But this is the most burning issue, and I just want to raise that and uh, ask the chair, the, 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 the panel, to see how well they can address that situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, right, we have another. Uh, you can just pass the microphone. 
Hi, pleasant good afternoon. My name is Reba Bowen. I'm a resident of the Reba Bowen. Yeah, I'm a resident of the this Rio Claro district. And um, I want to begin by apologizing on behalf of my community because I was really dumbstruck when I saw the amount of empty chairs. But that doesn't take away from what has to be done, and I'm sure what will be done. Um, I've heard the contributions of Mr. Peters and Mr. Kose. Mine's is different. In my lifetime, this is the first opportunity I am getting to add or listen to or to pay attention. But I want to also say for it to be palatable, I want to take out pin from the young man before. We have to find a way to make it attractive to the youth. God forbid that nothing happens coming out of this. How many of y'all would be here to say that y'all were part of what transpired at this one? We need the involvement of the youth. I believe the youths have a contribution to make as it pertains to the Constitution and what it should look like because if it is to go how we, we are saying it, we're going to go. They're going to be your age or my age by the time it, the work is done. Yeah? And... We want to ensure that this time we make it different. We learn from the lessons that would have gone, why it wasn't implemented. Ye yes, the politicians are the ones to finally make it happen. But if we don't involve or we don't find the mechanism to attract the youth and, and the wider community, it might just well be the politicians would not pay attention. But the minute the rooms are becoming full and, and the youth are involved, I'm sure they would pay attention and they would find a way to make it happen because the institutions are failing us. The commissions that the gentleman spoke to before. I mean, when you hear what is before them and think of time they're taking to make a decision. That's uncalled for. For instance, the judiciary. Some people go before the judiciary and, and, and the judges give them an immediate verbal decision. Some have to wait months. Who dictates that? I think the, it should be somewhere in the Constitution that we could fix these things and not have to overhaul the entire thing to make it workable. So I want to rest by saying I look forward to the real deal when, 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 when you all submit what should be done and, and, and I, I hope that the youth is going to be featured in what you all propose so that we could get a wider cross-section of views in the final product of what you all propose as a new constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Over here. Good night. Good night to the head table. Good night to the chairman. Good night, Mr. Peters. Good night, all present. My name is Ryan Stewart. I am the councillor for Mayaro. Came from the Mayaro district. Um, and having sat down listening to all the contributions, I think it's imperative that we understand and take this back to the schools. It is important, and you would have asked a question to Mr. Cozy, if we should implement the schools and flyers. That's two methods in which we can get the message across. But it's important that we bridge the gap because there seems to be a disconnect between the young people and experience. And the experience is important for those that are coming behind. 
the only is how they will be able to soon lead. They need time. They need to spend time with the experience and understand the document. The Constitution is a living document. It's not something that is going to, to stay because we're living in a changing world. The world is changing. The people are changing. The way we do stuff changes. COVID taught us that. You know, we don't need another major um, situation in the world to understand that the world is changing. We know that. We know it constantly changing. I, if I stand corrected, this is the fifth or sixth consultation. How many times are we going to talk and talk and talk? And as Mr. Peter said, we need to grow and start implementing. We wouldn't get everything right at the first time, but that is part of the process. There's a lesson in failure too. So we may make mistakes, but that is where we will know what can work and what cannot work, as opposed to when we do these type of stuff, shelf it. We shelf too many stuff, and there are not enough continuity in when we come about with ideas and in terms of implementing. So that's my contribution for tonight. Um, I would like to see it back in the schools, because for the ones that went to school and had the constitution back then, today, they can still, they can still explain, because it's no knowledge is wasted knowledge. I learned that. So once we implement it in the schools and we get it going, that knowledge will then contribute and go back to our society, go back to our country, and we can move forward. So that is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, contributions from the floor? You want to just stand up so the cameras can catch you. Yeah. Um, as I'm here, so that it's documented. I think it may be important in the Constitution to define the individual or person as well as a citizen. Um, I know under the current iteration, it's there, um, but I think those two things in, a, in particular in a more explicit way. As, uh, additionally, I think there should be a clear definition for children Right, reflected in the Constitution, and so that as we go about then working around those three definitions in particular, the rights that we give to the citizen, we are cognizant about the definition that we have for a person or an individual, so that as we build out our rights, we don't have, or at least similarly, I'm reflecting on current situations, international law, etc. as well, um, we do not replace the old system that we have with a system that still leaves us wanting with legislation on immigration and all of these different things. I, that will also lend itself to a clear definition I, or what I believe should be reflected as a principal value of the Republican Constitution is the right of the individual to productive work. Um, I think depending on how that is built out as well, the protection of the worker, wages as well, are very important to me. Um, it, I'm not sure in terms of the Constitution, but in a, reflecting the sentiments of the councillors, the educational programming, the way that the curriculum design is set up as a structure built into the ministry, etc. Those are things that we, the public, should have an interest in. And especially because at present, the real world situation is dealing with issues and concepts that you kind of have to teach the children. I, I do think the way the system is set up takes into consideration that a child learns empathy. And so as you build out the development of the child around the public education system, et cetera, those things become important. So that the educational programming reflects the values of the country, the republic. Um, yeah, just those, thanks. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. So what I'm gathering here, to some extent, is that the Constitution has to be widely disseminated, and especially among the young people. So Mr. Suknanan, being a teacher, would remember the book 
uh, by Mr. Wilfred D. Bess on civics. That was a book that was available in the primary schools. So that is what perhaps the Ministry of Education can look at. Putting back a book on civics and the simpler aspects of the Constitution could be in that book. Don't forget, children at the primary age are about 11, 12 maximum. But the Constitution can be a subject, a CXC subject in the schools. And that is where you have a good population, a big population of young people, the future leaders of the country. It's all in the secondary schools. So the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, or indeed the Caribbean, we could be just part of that whole uh, su subject area. It could be taught in the schools as a CXE subject, so that you have to learn it to pass it. And you have to make up numbers in, in, in subject areas. So teach it in the schools. That's where you need to do it. You know, the writer in me always come out every time I hear something like what you just say there. That is the ideal idea, what you're saying there to have the constitutional thought. But I want to tell you that in, if we go in ahead with the trend that we have in the schools today, then every Monday morning or every time school close and open back, we've got to change the constitution. Because right now in all our schools, the books that my little daughter used in the last semester in school, she can't use it when school go back in. It have the same name, but they change two words inside it and tell you, that you who come in the now can't use it. So if, it, if it indeed we have in the constitution in schools, I mean, I don't know how, we going, how that is going to work because they have to change something in it every day because it's a scheme. Really, the whole system in the school is a scheme to get people to buy books that they don't have the money to really buy. And I say this without fear of contradiction because if you talk to poor people out there, I buy books for them all the time. I do have a child going to school right now, but I buy more school books than, than you will imagine. And the same books, the same books that they just used, I mean, if we have any parent in here? The same books that they just used last September, when the next September come back. I remember when we were going to school, I used to use, I, I used my uncle books. I used my uncle books in my school because it was the same books that they gave us. To, but now they have the same book with the same name but you have to go and buy a new one because it had three words somebody changed inside it and say, and say that's a new edition. So they have edition. So then we'll have plenty editions of the Constitution and that might work. I'm not quite sure, but I hope that to see the Constitution in schools the way that it is written and not change it every Monday morning to buy our next Constitution. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. I would just like to add to what Mr. Peter said and um, the chairperson, Mr. Sinanan, mentioned about the school system and the, what, what, what obtains at this time. And we know that there is a problem, but uh, my suggestion, uh, based on my opinion of you cannot straighten a band tree, right? We have to take these children at primary school age. And I want to, to, to submit here um, for, 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 for recommendation, as a recommendation to uh, things like scouting, girl guides in the primary school, which leads up to cadets and so on in the secondary school, would have the children disciplined. Teaching the constitution in the primary school, it is already loaded. It's a curriculum. These children, with, 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 with everything else, it's... The, the, the school curriculum has to be revisited, whereby we educate the children in keeping in tandem with the movements of modern day technology and so on, and stop giving them this. I mean, as a standard five teacher, at some point in time, the, the anxiety, the stress, both on teachers and the, the children. It's, 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 it's not really, um, to me, for the children at that age. And they go into secondary school, and we find that there are a lot of burnout. When they reach standard uh, form two, form three, 
and, and, and they cannot perform for some reason or the other. There's nothing in place, all right? As a past district commissioner from Mayaro Rio Claro, I can see that a lot of work had been done, and um, it, it, it is voluntary, so it is difficult to get people to come out and, and volunteer their time to take these kids out and to, to have activities and to plan. It, it is a, a, a great, great um, task. And so if the, this forum can, can, can motivate the powers that be to introduce things like scouting in the school curriculum, I, and, and again, I want to make it clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of the, of the Scout Association of Trinidad and Tobago, but as a past Scout Commissioner for Mayara Rio Claro, I am not authorized to speak on behalf of, Mr., um, of the Com National Scout Commissioner. So I just want to make that clear, but scouting to me, is a true alternative. Many of us, well, I, I looking at the age here, who didn't grow up in scouting would have been privy to the, to, 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 to the training growing up then. We don't see young people here because they are not interested. They have other distractions. All right, simple as we take children to camp and so on. You have to ask them to leave their phones at home. We could include the technology in the school, marry everything, use the school's curriculum to teach the children um, Let's say like in scouting, you have um, the national flag, the, the meaning of the colors, the dimension, and so on. It is done in social studies in standard one. So there, is, there has to be some merger where we can disseminate this information to the children at a young age, keep them disciplined, so that when they leave the secondary school system, they would already be in a mindset that they are going to respect the constitution as we heard before, um, the, nobody is interested in, 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 the, in constitutional reform because they probably fed up or, 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 or the way it is done, I don't know. So I'm just making this um, clarion call for social, for programs to lift the social welfare of the, the, the children the, in true scouting and so on. All right? Thank you, Mr. Gar. Thank you very much, Mr. Suknanan. Um, any other uh, proposals from the floor?